I would like to uh, request Tamanipati Praga, as always, with Namaka, Namaskara Mantra. Thank you, Peter. May I request one and all, please hold your hands in prayer pose and close your eyes gently. Namaskar Mahamantra. Om Rim Namo Thank you very much, uh, Swana Pragyaji and Pratipa Pragyaji. I uh, would like to move on to our annual conference, which is the 22nd, and um, hand over to Ulle Quanström, my good friend and colleague from the University of Lund, where he is a professor, and uh, he takes on some of the burden of chairing these uh, Zoom meetings it would be otherwise too much. So he will be chairing the first meeting. And uh, please, Ole, take it away. Mm. Thank you very much, Peter. We are, of course, all most thankful to you for arranging today's workshop, despite the troublesome times in which we live. Uh, we all know that you are a person who has a deep and close connection to Jainism. As a matter of fact, you embody the ideal of Ahimsa to the extent that even your name is the name of a Tirtankara. Your surname, Flügele, when translated into Sanskrit, is, as we all know, the name of the 23rd Tirtankara. <laughs> Just a joke. Anyway, let us begin. <laughs> as you all know, we have noticed our schedule is tight, it's very tight. Uh, each lecture is assigned 20 minutes and only five minutes is set aside for a discussion. So we must try to do our best to stick to the timetable. Our first speaker is the art historian and former director of the Museum of Modern Art in Mumbai, Saryu Doshi, whom I think we all know through her excellent and numerous publications. The title of her paper is Violence Depicted in Manuscripts of the Digambara Yashodara Sharita. And I think this will be a recorded lecture. Huh? Non-violence in Jaina philosophy, literature and art. It is indeed an honor to present a paper at this conclave. And I thank Professor Dr. Peter Flugel, Chair, Center of Jaina Studies, Professor in the Study of Religions and Philosophies, School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, for his invitation to participate in this seminar. The title of my paper today is Violence, Intent and Act as Elucidated in Jain Dharmakathas. 
In the vast and ancient Jain literary tradition, there are texts on religious doctrines as well as a rich collection of treatises on non-canonical subjects such as medicine, mathematics and astrology. Included in the latter section are a number of dharmakathas, parables, which elucidate religious principles in a simplified and engaging manner. These dharmakathas contain elements of fantasy and adventure, as also strange occurrences including supernatural phenomena. They admirably serve the purpose of edifying and instructing the devotees and thereby effectively reinforcing Jain moral values. Certain dharmakathas explain the cardinal principle of Jainism, ahimsa, an injunction to refrain from committing himsa. Hinsa is defined as taking away life by actions of the body, speech and mind and are influenced by anger, pride, deceit and greed. The killing of living beings or engaging in actions hurtful to others leads to sinful karma, consequences of which are born in this life or in future births or in hell. In the treatise Gyan Arnava, Hinsa is described as a gateway to the miserable state. It is also the ocean of sin. It is itself terrible hell, and it is surely the most dense of darkness. Himsa is classified as Bhava Himsa, the intention to cause harm, and Drabya Himsa, the actual act of causing harm. The concept of Himsa is to be viewed as being twofold, because it makes no distinction between these two types of Himsa, even though Bhava Himsa is essentially emotional, whereas Dravya Himsa denotes the actual act of violence. Both forms are equally sinful because the act is implicit in the intent. This tenet and its repercussions are graphically delineated in the illustrated Dingambar Jain tale of Yashodhar Charitra. The story of Yashodhar Charitra. King Maridatta Vyodeya invited Vairavananda, a Kapalika ascetic, claimed supernatural powers. During their conversation, Bhairavananda informed the king that it was possible to acquire the ability to move in the air, provided goddess Chandamari was propitiated with sacrificial offerings of a male and female of every living species. The king, greatly tempted by the possibility, issued orders for the performance of the sacrifice. Maybe he's not Just the when the rituals were about to commence, Bhairavanan <laughs> noticed that among the players of the various species brought for the sacrifice, that of human beings was missing. The king's soldiers went in search for a pair of human beings and apprehended two young acolytes who had just arrived in the city in Jain monk Sudatta's group of followers. When King Maridatta saw the two acolytes, he was struck by their grave demeanor and noble deportment. He wondered if they were of royal descent and asked them why they had chosen a spiritual path at such a tender age. Shilaka Abhiruchi then began his narrative. The land of Avanti, he said, was ruled by King Yashodhara, and I was his son, Yashodhara, in one of my previous births. On noticing a strand of grey hair, King Yashodhara appointed his son Yashodhara as his successor and departed to the forest. King Yashodhara found the duties and responsibilities of governing the kingdom irksome and preferred to spend time with his queens in the harem. One day, Queen Amritmati heard melodious music and on inquiry was informed that the performer was an ugly hunchback elephant keeper. The queen found the music irresistible and fell in love with the deformed man and began to visit him surreptitiously at night. One night, King Yashodhara was awakened by the sound of footsteps as Queen Amritmati tiptoed out of the room. He picked up his sword and followed her and was shocked to see her fall at the feet of a hunchback elephant keeper apologizing for being late. In fury, the queen's deformed paramour pulled her by her hair, upbraiding her while he beat her with a stick. Queen Amritmati calmed him down by saying she would pray to the mighty goddess for her husband's death. The king was ready to behead them both, but was overcome by revulsion and left.
extremely disturbed at the events that had occurred the previous night. King Yashodara approached his mother and struck himself with a sword, saying he wished to die because of a bad dream. His mother prevented him from killing himself and suggested that they would counter the effects of the evil dream by propitiating goddess Chandamari by the sacrificial offering of a cock. Yashodara was reluctant to perform any ritual involving violence but gave in to his mother's pleas when she proposed that the sacrificial cock will not be a live bird, but one fashioned out of flower. Accordingly, King Yashadara went to the temple of goddess Chandamari with his mother, and they sacrificed a cock made of flower. Unable to rid himself of the feelings of disgust and despondency, King Yashodara decided to leave and handed over the affairs of the state to his son Yashodara. On hearing the news of King Yashodara's departure to the forest, Queen Amritmati appeared inconsolable. She begged her husband to come to her pavilion for a farewell feast as she wished to accompany him. Wicked Amritmati served poison food to Chandramati and Yashodara. The former died instantly. But Yashodara fell on the ground, writhing in pain. Wailing in grief, Amritmati threw herself at Yashodara and while clinging to him, strangled him to death. Yashodara performed the funeral rites with piety and prayed for the peace of his father and grandmother. Effects of Sin Shiloka Abhayaruchi then continued the story of Yashodara by saying that since Yashodhara and his mother Chandramati had both sinned gravely by offering a cock as sacrifice, even though it was not a live bird but an imitation of it in flower, their intent to kill was as great a sin as an actual act of killing. As a consequence of this sin, they had to undergo a series of rebirths. In his first birth, Yashodhara was born as a peacock. A hunter killed his mother and took him home. The little peacock grew into a beautiful bird and the hunter presented him to King Yashamati. Meanwhile, Chandramati was born in her first birth as a dog in Yashamati's palace. One day, while wandering around in the palace gardens, the peacock spied Amritmati with her hunchback lover. Recalling the events of his past birth, the peacock angrily attacked him. In defense, Amritmati flung her girdle at him and broke his leg. The dog chased the limping bird and killed it. King Yashomati, in a fit of rage, slew the dog for having killed his pet peacock. In their next rebirths, Yashodhara was a snake and Chandramati a porcupine. The porcupine chased and killed the snake and in turn it was killed by a bird with prey. In their following rebirths, Yashodhara was born as a large fish and Chandramati as a crafty crocodile. Once when the palace maids came to bathe in the river, the crocodile grabbed one of them and dragged her down to the bottom of the river. This incident angered King Yashomati and he ordered that the crocodile be killed. When the crocodile was captured, by chance the fish also got caught in the net. The crocodile was killed, but the fish was taken to the royal kitchen and served as a delicacy to the king. Thereafter, in the fourth round of their rebirths, Chandramati and Yashodara were born as wild goats. Once while copulating with Chandramati, Yashodara was killed by a hunter and his soul passed into Chandramati's womb. Chandramati was captured and taken to the royal kitchens for the shraddha ceremonies of Yashomati's late father, Yashodara. When the goat was butchered, the baby goat was found alive in her womb and was reared by the palace attendants. Queen Amritmati, now suffering from leprosy on account of her evil deeds, saw the little lamb and ordered it to be roasted alive for her meal. After being killed as a goat, Chandramati was reborn as a buffalo and was wallowing in a pond when a horse came for a drink of water. In annoyance, the buffalo attacked the horse and gored him to death. The horse owner complained about it to King Yashomati, who immediately ordered that the buffalo be roasted alive. 
In their sixth rebirth, Yashoda and Chandramati were born as beautiful chicks, he as a cock and she as a hen, and were presented to King Yashomati. To celebrate the spring festival, King Yashomati and his beloved queen went to their forest lodge where the chicks were kept in a cage. Hearing a giant monk's religious discourse, caged birds recalled their past lives and began to crow pathetically. Their cries disturbed the king engaged in amorous dalliance with his queen, and he shot an arrow at them, killing them both at once. The souls of the birds passed into the queen's womb to be born as twins, Abhayaguchi and Abhaymati. While on a hunting expedition, King Yashomati passed a monk meditating under a tree. That day he failed to find any game and while returning, he again passed the same monk and concluded that the sight of the holy man had been a bad omen, causing him to return empty-handed from the hunt. He ordered his dogs to attack the monk. The dogs rushed towards the holy man, but as they neared him, they stopped and stood still. In frustration, the king was ready to charge at the holy man with his sword, but was restrained by a merchant devotee present there. The merchant informed the king that this holy man was the former king of Kalinga, who had renounced his kingdom in repentance for the sin of punishing an innocent person and was now the highly venerated Jain monk Suddhat. In repentance, King Yashomati bowed to monk Suddhatta and considered cutting off his own head to atone for his sins. Monk Suddhatta interrupted his thoughts and prevented him from acting impulsively. Astounded at the monk's ability to read minds, the king implored the monk to tell him where his father, mother and grandfather were at this particular point in time. The monk informed him that his father and grandmother were born as his own twin children his father as son Abhayruchi and his grandmother as daughter Abhaymati. His mother Amritmati was suffering in the fifth hell for her heinous behavior. King Yashomati was overcome with emotions and wished to become a homeless mendicant. Shulaka Abhayruchi concluded by saying that when we heard Mang Siddhartha, my sister and I recalled our former wives and we fainted. On regaining consciousness, we also desired to take the vows of renunciation. But Monk Suddhatta, because of our age, advised us to join his Sangha as acolytes and were captured by the soldiers and brought to this temple. King Mari Tatta was profoundly affected by Abhay Ruchi's narrative and felt guilty at the violence that was going to be perpetrated at the sacrificial ritual that he had arranged. Wherever Ananda too became illusioned about his religions and the mode of worship it advocated. Both King Maridatta and Kapalika Bhairavadans chose to abandon their former religious beliefs and embrace the path of non-violence. They turned Mount Suddhartha Sangha as his followers. I wish to express my deep indebtedness to Miss Aarti Bhattar independent research scholar in Dalaji for her constructive suggestions and invaluable contribution towards the preparation of this paper. To Forum Pandya, my grateful thanks and sincere appreciation for preparing this superb AD presentation. And I thank you all for being here today and listening to this parable of Yashoda Charita. Thank you. I'm going to let him come on the camera. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the most interesting and uh, illuminating lecture. Uh, I think we have time for one question and then we have to proceed on to the next speaker. So is there any one of you who would like to put the questions to Dr. Doshi? You can do that now, but we, we just have time for one question, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there are any questions. Well, I, I have a question. Yes. Hello. <laughs> Good to Hi, see you live. <laughs> um, where are the 
um, the images from? Can you say something about these wonderful pictures? The images are from a number of manuscripts. And this is one of the most uh, profusely uh, illustrated tale in the Digambar Jain tradition. And the main, as you can see, the main message is on Ahimsa. And the cause of Ahimsa is uh, sort of celebrated in this Dharmakatha. But the manuscripts are from the 15th century to the 18th century. And they are in all sorts of, uh, from various areas like Rajasthan, from, the, from uh, UP, and these uh, Gujarat, these three or four areas, they were illustrated. And they are done by various Munis, written by various Munis, not just one person. So these are quite very interesting um, things. I have only shown you some of the episodes being a 15 minute uh, presentation. But uh, actually, when you talk about it, it's far more interesting to hear than to read about it. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Toshi. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, our next speaker, I think, needs no further presentation. Uh, Hampanaji have contributed extensively to Jane's studies and been part of our conferences at SOAS for many years. Uh, his paper has the exciting title, Pearls and Black Pepper. So please, Hampanaji. Ah, hello, Peter. Yeah, um, Peter is lucky today. Our Abai Firodia has extended his Abaya Hasta in the very beginning of this. Day. Therefore, I simply proceed with my paper, uh, Pearls and Black Pepper. <clears throat> the subject of fusing words of different languages is universally important and yet rarely discussed in other languages the way it has metaphorically debated by medieval Canada writers. The credit goes to Canada writers Sri Vijaya, Pampa, Pona and Nagavarma and other Prakrit Sanskrit author Virasina Chaitya in particular. Poets employ metaphors to spice their writings. The metaphors employed to address the issue of Mani Pravala deserve a revisit and extensive discussion which is of consequence to literary criticism. The Sanskrit compound Mani Pravala, Red Jewel and Red Korath is a metaphor for homogeneous mixture of words from different languages. It speaks of words of same kind and is silent about non-homogeneous compounds. Addressing the lacuna Canada writers extended semantic scope of the Mani Pravala concept and took it to its logical end. For the opposite of homogeneous Mani Pravala, red jewel and red coral mixture, Canada authors coined the metaphor Muthu and Melasu, white pearl and black pepper for non-homogeneous mixture. Sri Vijaya, 850, was the earliest writer to thoroughly discuss this topic, <clears throat> first in 11 verses, and then sum up in two beautiful verses. Quote, traditional scholars prescribe harmonious usage of words identical with Sanskrit, where original Sanskrit words are used to in Kannada compositions with little change. Kannada words 
however should not be mixed with sanskrit ones in the following ways sanskrit words that are indeclinable and must therefore be understood through context if these sanskrit words are mixed with kannada poetic compositions the effect is not pleasing but harsh to the ear improper and proper mixing is illustrated to emphasize that proper use of sanskrit words in kannada works will be pleasing if sanskrit words are introduced without knowledge and mixed with kannada words in compounds it will be like mixing butter milk with boiling milk incompatibility and compatibility of kannada and sanskrit words is explained with a suitable example when sanskrit and kannada are used in homogeneous compounds like this they look beautiful like jewels in a gold ornament in poetry one should use soft words arranged beautifully knowing whether they fit or do not fit poetry should not be like the mixing of curds with rice paddy even if one obtains the desired meaning if words are strung together in the wrong way it would be like stringing pearls with pepper seeds words that do not fit should be left out an entirely new model of norms on literary practices in canada was constructed and generated by jaina writers assimilation of alien words needs an extra k and more so in mixing grammarian keshi raja of 13th century has cited two metaphors of nellum mosaru that is rice paddy and curds and muttum melasum pearls and pepper to illustrate non homogeneous mixture subsequent poets and shastrakaras have employed the same metaphors maybe because of its proprietary this confirms that pampa ponna and nagavarma and keshraja had read and were familiar with the kaviraja margam of the 9th century the manipravala concept was an ancient innovation by early jaina commentators in the process of rendering prakrit and sanskrit canons and their scholia translators felt the need for combining words of two different languages for accurately communicating intended intended meaning but rule of grammar forbids such compounds under the rubric arisamasa hostile compounds chief pontiffs had to permit the language mixture acharya virasena of 8th century approved it by giving a new name manipravala and himself became the pioneer to use it i have discussed this extensively elsewhere sheldon pollock has discussed the concept of manipravala in the cosmopolitan vernacular background quote manipravala embodied the very process of localization of the sanskrit universal in both political discourse and literature that was occurring across southern asia with the vernacular at first supplementing sanskrit and later taking on an ever increasing proportion as vernacularization gained power and confidence unquote. Pollock 
has cited examples from Kannada, Tamil, and Malayalam literature. He writes about Veera Choli in Karikai of, by Puttamitaran of mid 11th century, which examines both grammar and literature. The statement that it is here that we find the earliest use of the term Manipravala to refer to register that permits the inclusion of inflected Sanskrit word in Tamil poetry is not correct because 200 years and 250 years earlier to this Virasenacharya had used the term Manipravala. Recently, Andrew Wallet had reposted his note on the subject called the most common metaphor for a good mixture of language in South Asia is Jewel Koral, Mani Pravala, which has a very long history. Part of what is good about this mixture is that the elements retain their individuality in one sense, but in another form, a homogeneous whole, as do red jewel and red coral strung on a red necklace. Of language, Nagavarma, also known as Kavita Gunodaya, wrote the following work. Palaganadada Pudungole, Kole Sakkamamam, Tagulchi, Jangide, Muttum, Melasum, Kodante, Pelva Aligavigala Kavite, Gudaran Yete Gulgume. That is the poetry of those horrible poets who write by putting awful Sanskrit together with old Kannada for want of skill as if stringing pearl and black pepper are skilled readers really taken in? The above verse condemns the combination of Kannada and Sanskrit words in composition, comparing it to the stringing together of pearl and black pepper. Nrupatunga and Naisena have also condemned the practice, characterizing it respectively as a pouring of buttermilk into boiling milk and as a mixing together of clarified butter and oil. From this, it is clear or evident that from the earliest times, purism in the use of Canada has been advocated and insisted on by the leading writers in that language who were by no means behind in that in their knowledge of Sanskrit. There is as much difference between good and bad poetry as there is between a lute and a wooden stool. I think this is probably a counter metaphor to Manipravalam. If Jewel Coral minimizes the contrast, then Pearl pepper maximizes them, since pearl is white and pepper is black. Nagavarma's usage is a notable here, since it kind of embodies the qualities he is criticizing. Muttum is a Sanskrit word and would have been recognized as such, although modified slightly from it's a Sanskrit form mukta, but Melisu has no Sanskrit cognate. If early poets' observation on the topic, which is missing in Andrew Hollett's repost of 2019, is added, it, it will minimize or it will Ill illuminate and give a new dimension to the important and relevant literary discussion. Now, the question is, who was the earliest poet to use this phrase before or after Srividya in the 9th century?
according to the extent examples chronologically it is pampa who looks to be the earliest poet in the beginning of 10th century immediately followed by pona as noted above manipravala helped writers and commentator to mix prakrit and sanskrit kannada and prakrit or kannada and sanskrit homogeneously but it gave room for unhappy mixtures and warranted strict reminder to stick to standard set by early masters shri vijaya and epic poets pampa and pona emphasized the need for pleasing mixture of local and alien debate did not end there polyhistor scholar poet nagavarma of 11th century breathed fresh air to revive the manipravala concept the metaphor muttum and melusum had become popular before pampa was born whether gunavarma had also employed it is not known after the kaviraja margam the metaphor figures in the epic poem vikramarjuna vijayam it figures in an episode where the main character arjuna is deeply engrossed in tapas austerity infatuated by his beauty the celestials urvashi menaka ramha and tilottama ask him to give up meditation and satisfy their sexual desire therefore the casual arjuna your matted hair arjuna and ash smeared body is befitting a med- is befitting a meditation but the quiver tied to your back the bow in your hand and the armor you are wearing or ought to penance the peculiar way of your penance is like stinging muttum and melusum white pearls with black pepper how does it match arjuna and coat the self explanatory metaphor does not require comments the poet has used it appropriately and the meaning is transparent ponna junior contemporary of poet pampa partaking in the discourse has added a fresh air to the debate he was aware of the manipravala concept its historical background and that it figures in the kaviraja margam in addition to the metaphor pearls and pepper for unpleasant mixture he has recorded one more metaphor of curds and paddy morum and nellum ponna is the only author who has used both metaphors except that he has substituted the word curds therefore the poet has repeated the same metaphor but his contribution to the debate is in illuminating the historical background these details are not found elsewhere ponna's critic is as follows quote brief introduction to the context king magadha king magadha offered precious presents and profusely praised his overlord emperor shantinatha the emperor's brother offered seat by his side to magadha and told him magadha your words are clear a self explanatory vrutti exposition does not warrant a vartika commentary on the original text any extra explanation to your transparent speech will amount to kanta shosha drying the throat or vain talk your words mr magadha are beyond the reach of divine beings because to understand their complex words we have to seek nyasakaras or commentators explanation 
old scholar's words resemble pearl and pepper string. Only an erudite could write commentary and not an insignificant. For quintessential words, the so-called highly learned are worried in writing commentaries similar to mixing rice paddy and curds. Others are not at all bothered. Therefore, the construction of words should be cordial and complementary like the soul and body which leads to moral merit." Unquote. <clears throat> above, the above two verses, Shantinata, emperor's brother, continues and concludes his conversation with Magadha, Jiva and Sharira, the soul and body, are mutually fused. Similarly, the concordance of Vachana Rachanayum, the world order, and Artha, its meaning, is embedded in your speech. It is clear Panna is taking a dig at the commentaries with unhappy mixture of words. His details suggest that poets were not happy with the pedantic or non-creative writing. Perhaps commentaries were not popular and that may be one of the reasons for the loss of valuable commentary text. We can also infer, infer, uh, we can also infer that expositors and poets were not in good terms. Words should enter into a poem in accordance with the thought of the poet and should not be permitted to counteract it. The language of the culture land must be maintained in the use of Kannada words. Propriety must be observed for Sanskrit words in due course and due measure and no stumbling over Sanskrit words with their harsh phonemes should be permitted. The composition thereby achieves sweetness and becomes strong, growing forth like the sprout of a vine. Such is the way of the one endowed with the consistent political wisdom is the opinion of Pollock. The Vrutta in Kaviraja Marka speaks about the suitable words. According to the way of the king of poets, a poem should contain suitable words conveying only intended meanings. Kannada speech should convey what is in Vartai Vilma, what is idiomatic to the language of the people. Sanskrit words that are harsh should not obstruct the flow. Words should be used so as to demonstrate the poet's ability and should flow naturally like the sprout of a wine. Nagavarma, a prolific writer and a giant of literary zones, is far more profoundly influenced by Sanskrit than Prakrit. He examines grammar, rhetorical science, poetics, prosody and literature. He has not mentioned the word Manipravala, but he is aware of its specific application in the structure of compounds. Later grammarians have dealt this issue under the rubric Arisamasa, compound of hostiles. The concept Manipravala had wide-ranging effect on syntactic structure of vernacular languages and Sanskrit. Lastly, in the present day context, we can extend the debate by considering the mixture of English words instead of Sanskrit words and Kannada vernacular languages. Because this is an ongoing process and day by day mixing of English words with language of place is increasing. Therefore, the problem and process are running parallel. Thank you.
for patiently listening to my paper. Thank you very much for most interesting uh, paper, Dr. Hampana. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have time for any questions. Uh, I mean, the, the the lectures will be recorded, and people can all, all always contact you with questions. Or so, but I, unfortunately, I think we have to go on to our next speaker, and that is um, Ulle. Yeah, Ulle, Andrew Ollett has, has just put an excellent question on. Maybe this okay. one could be answered in the in the Q and A page. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let me read that to you, um, uh, Dr. Hampana. Thank you, Hampana, for this talk. An overview of the use of these metaphors in early Canada poetry is very valuable. One question. The metaphor of pearls and black pepper appears to be used in the Kaviraja Marga, not in reference yeah. to the mixture of Sanskrit in Canada, but of words, Tabdam, that do not suit the meaning. Do you agree? And if so, who do you think Nagavarma understood the metaphor differently. Why, why did yeah. Nagavarma understood the metaphor differently? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, recently the text Kaviraja Marga, which was written in, in, the, in the year 850 by Sri Vidya, he was a court poet, poet laureate of Nrupatunga, uh, one of the emperors of the Rashtrakuta dynasty, an imperial dynasty who ruled for 200 years. And the old Kannada work Kaviraja Marka has been translated to English. The entire text has been translated to English by Professor R. V. S. Sundaram in collaboration with one of his friends. And apart from that, we, I, I am uh, well, I will be very happy to draw your attention or any um, other person or scholar interested in the subject that Pollock, uh, Sheldon Pollock, in his work, uh, that magnum opus work, uh, The Language of uh, Gods in the World of Man, he has also referred to the importance of this Kaviraja Marka and he has. Uh, well, uh, extensively examined uh, in the context of uh, uh, Muttum and Medicine, Pearl and Black Pepper. Wow. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, um, our next speaker um, is Fujinaga Sin. Um, and um, Fujinaga Sin, we know, is the most knowledgeable scholar of Jainism and of Jaina philosophy. And he has also contributed extensively to Jain studies, as well as being part of, of the workshop as so as for many years. Uh, the title of his paper is How to Avoid Himsa, explained by Pujapada. So please, Pujinagasin. So, yes. uh, okay. Good afternoon and a good evening from Japan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, today, I'd like to uh, explore uh, the idea of Ahinsa or Hinsa in Pujapada's works. Uh, second slide, please. Yes. Uh, the Pujapada is most popular as the author of the Sarvata Siddhi uh, commentary on Umas Bahamin's Tattvata Sutra. The first Sanskrit grammar in Jainism, uh, Jainanda Vyakarana, by Devan, Devanandin, is attributed to, the, to him. Two works on philosophical subject are also written by Pujapada, namely Ishtapadesha and Samadhi Tantra. Uh, today, our discussion is mainly concerned with Sarvata Siddhi, while uh, Samadhi Tantra will be referred to additionally. A third paper, slide please. Uh, in Tattvata Sutra, we come across the word ahinsa, ahinsa for the first time at the rather later part, namely in the uh, first sutra of chapter seven. It reads, I, I quote, Hinsa, Anlita, Steya, Abrahmacharya, Parigraha, Parigrahe, Bioho, Biratil, Bratam. This means 
the bar consists of the leaving from injury, lie, still, unchastity, and at attachment. Definition of Hinsa appears later, namely in the Sutra 13 of the chapter 6. This means that, first of all, uh, Shinsa itself is uh, something to be avoided for the giants, or they should avoid the activity or behavior called Hinsa. The sutra quoted above shows the five kinds of activities to avoid, and Hinsa is put as the first of them, because it is the most important and avoidance of other four are support to Hinsa, namely Ahinsa. Then, what the giant intend by the word Hinsa? The Sutra Sati, Sati explained, I quote, Pramatta Yoga Prana Vyaparopanam Hinsa. I translate, Hinsa means taking out vital energy through uh, abnormal behavior. Uh, we can't endure no living beings. Only living beings are objects of Hinsa. The giants, as other scholars of a school of Indian philosophy do, regard the prana or vital energy is fundamental of life. This prana is 10 kinds. The five concerning five sense organs, one for body power, one for respiration, one for speech, one for mind, and one for lifespan. Uh, this is referred to, to in Sarvata Siddhi section 286. Suppose one of our sense, sense organs, say skin, is forced to stop working by other, we may feel uneasy and get ill. This is a form of violence or hinsa in the wider sense of the word. Moreover, it must be noted here that the number of prana which a living being has varies from one to 10 in correspondence with the its degree of development. The lowest being, plant for example, has one prana while human has 10. This suggests that the activity of Hinsa has degree when it has begun. We can rather discern rationally through just reflecting our daily life. We may take away a life of a plant by pulling it out from the earth. At another occasion, we may kill an animal, say a deer, when we hit it by car, both a case of hinsa. But in the former, we do not feel, so, feel sorry, while in the latter, many of us may blame ourselves. So, the theory of number of prana can explain the difference of the, these feelings. Strictly speaking, as understood from the Sutra 13, we commit hinsa when we take away a, the prana with abnormal behavior. To support this, Pujapada quotes a passage. I quote, Biyojanti chashubiru natcha badena this means, I translate, even if one hurts others' breath, he does not commit injury. This means that if we give damage to other person or living beings with proper reason, namely not with abnormal behavior, then we do not kill it. In other words, not all hurting are regarded as hinsa. For a person with supreme self-control like Tirtankara, no rules would be needed to keep a hinsa. But for ordinary person like us, 
there should be some clear norms. Now, let us know what should be done to avoid Hinsa or to obey Hinsa Ahinsa. There are two types of norm for our purpose. The visible or concrete one and the mental or abstract one. Of the two, the former is Oh, in Tatva Sutra, uh, chapter 7, Sutra 4, read, I quote, Ban Mano Gupti, Iria Adana Nikshepana, Samati, Samiti, Alokta Pana Bojana Ni Panchach. I translate this. There are five observances for Ahinsa control of speech, control of thought, regulation of walking, care about taking and putting, and check of drinking and food. The first two concern the three parts of our behavior as described in the Tattva Sutra chapter 6, Sutra 1. The other three covers fundamental behavior in our daily life. These can be summed up as a control I mean, gupti and care, samiti, as we will see later. Mental or abstract face of the norm is kind of reflection. As Satva Sutra chapter 7, Sutra 9 reads, I quote, Hinsa adish ira amurti apaya abadhya darshanam. I translate. We must reflect upon loss and blame which we may receive in this world and in next when we commit injury and others. Suppose we commit murder. People who know that fact must feel frightened of us and leave from us. Then we will lose a lot. Moreover, murder, according to Puja Pada, leads us the bad life in the next life. Therefore, we should avoid and hate injure and others. The first several sutras of chapter 9 of Sattva Sutra gives detailed description how to avoid Ahinsa and Pujapada explains them more deeply. The first sutra says that the, the obstruction of influx is stoppage, and Pujapada shows a complex relationship of stage of our ethical development, I mean, uh, Gunasthana, with stoppage at great length. Next two sutras tell us that the stoppage will be carried out by control, care, virtue, contemplation, overcoming of endurance, conduct, as well as austerity. These five are again explained by Masbamin in the following seven sutras. And the commentator gives a comment one by one. For our purpose, the explanation on control and care are important. First, let us have a look at the explanation on control or gupti. Umas Bahamin says in uh, Sattva Sutra, chapter 9, Sutra 4, Samya Yoga Nigraha Gupti. This means uh, regulation for proper behavior is control. Uh, on this, Pujapada comment as follows. Uh, I skip the text. I just translate this. Here, uh, behavior means activities of our body, speech, and mind as described. But sometimes we behave according to our desire. 
Svecha, and it may harm others. To avoid this, we must control our behavior. Controlling does not always have a good and favorable result. A notorious thief will control his or her behavior to steal others' properties successfully. To express, exclude such cases, an adjective proper samyak is added in the sutra. And the gender supports that our activities draw karmic matters toward us and they cover the natural good tendency of jiva. Thus, through the stopping follow of such a matter, we can be heard properly. In total, the sutra should be understood. In this way, through the regulation of body, speech, and mind for pro proper behavior, we control our activities. If we perfectly control our activities, Automatically, we can avoid improper behavior such as hinsa, but as imperfect beings, we often fail to do so. For such poor beings, must Bahamin propose several kinds of, of care, samiti. These are care on work, walk, conversation, begging, receiving with uh, putting and discharge. Of course, we have to do these in proper ways when many living beings exist. Lord, where we walk, food and receptacles for them, items we receive and place for putting them and place for discharge must have a huge number of uh, living beings. Careless activity at such places may harm them easily. Therefore, we should pay our full attention to such places. But why care on conversation is required? This care is not intended to avoid uh, physical violence, but mental one. Pujapada says that the monk taking care will tell gently and properly with good friends as well as bad friends. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so far, uh, we have seen the, uh, the idea of Ahinsa or Ahinsa in Pujapada's Salvata Siddhi. Summing up, Ahinsa is the most important element of our behavior. At all costs, Ahinsa must be obeyed and the Hinsa should be avoided. This attitude is very natural for the Pujapada as a giant. But is that all? In Samadhi Tantra, he declares that our uh, fortune comes with brothers and misfortune with non brothers If one wants to get the liberation, both should be abundant. Uh, yeah, Tatuba, uh, Samadhi Tantra 83. Mm. Apunyam, Abratail, Punyam, Bratail, Mokshaka, Tayor, Biaha, Abrata, Iba, Moksha, Artani, Bratani, Abi, Tatas. Our discussion on Ahinsa and that in the Tattva Sutra begin with Ahinsa as the first and the most important brother. But here, Pujapada recommends us to give up it. Moreover, he seems to put less importance on our one's uh, lineages and religious tradition. Those who stick to their own religion with lineage, I mean jati or religious marks, cannot attain the final emancipation. This is uh, mentioned in Samadhi Tantra 89. I read, jati ling, linga vikarpena yesham cha 
スマヤグラハハテアピナプラプヌバンティエバパラマナマパラマンパダムアートマナフ Then, what shall we do for the getting the emancipation, which is the final goal for、uh, obeying, obeying the Brata of Ahinsa? By devotion, Pujapada says, to another Atman or by worshipping it, we can reach the same state which it has attained as a, a wood catch. Catches fire by being put near it. This is mentioned in Samadhi Tantra 97. Binna Atma Nam, Upasta Atma Nam, Paro Babanti, Tadrishaha, Bratil, Bartil, Deepam, Yata, Upasiaha, Babati, Tadrishi. Here, he does not refer to the extraordinary person but common one like us. And he does not clearly deny the activity for avoiding Hinsa, but his opinion in Samadhi Tantra naturally leads to denial of effort to do so. What makes the difference of his opinion in his two works? In these two, he shows his two standpoints. And also, a、uh, commentary on the authentic compendium and enthusiastic、uh, specialist of meditation, Samadhi. As a former, he has to、uh, emphasize the principles or、uh, practice of Ahinsa because that is the main doctrine in the Jain tradition, perhaps in his days. On the other hand, as a yogin, He gives importance on the meditation, not on keeping、uh, Brata.、Uh, that is, thank you very much. Okay, th thank you very much for, for, for your most interesting lecture. And、uh, I guess it's midnight in Japan now, huh? Yeah, yes. So, so, I, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm very sleepy now. <laughs> You're very sleepy now. But thank you very, very much.、Uh, I guess、um, we should go for tea now, but maybe there is one or two, one question or two, one or two questions. Is、uh, anyone who w a n t to put a question to?、Um, to Uli, there's one by Anna in the, in the QA.、Yeah, exactly. There are two questions. Yeah, exactly. I see that. By Anna, yeah. Could you say a bit more about your decision to translate Pramatta Yoga s abnormal behavior instead of careless activity or something similar? Uh, in Tatava Sutra, you mean that in Tatava Sutra chapter 6, Sutra 13, Pramatta Yoga? Yeah.、Uh -huh. This、uh, with abnormal behavior means、uh, if we、uh, control ourselves, we can act,、uh, behave. In proper way, but even such time, in such case, we can commit uh, 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 injure or、uh, hurt other person. Such activity doesn't mean hinsa. In this case, pramatta means、uh, abnormal or, let's say, careless activity. Yeah, yeah, okay, so that was what I a s k e d Yes, the careless activity, for example,、mm. for that. Yes.、Mm. Um, uh, let me see. Now, there's another question,、uh, Gene Shet.、Uh, are there references in the canonical literature that distinguishes himsa and ahimsa based on care slash carelessness? Pramata.、Mm. Uh, in the、uh, canonical, I mean, the Shubetamra the canonical text? Yeah, maybe that's meant here. Yeah, I think so. Uh, uh, so far, I, I have no idea, but th there must be such a different,、uh, let's say, difference in、uh, Shubetamra canonical literature, too. But、uh, so far, I have, now I have no idea. No, Sorry. No. Okay, okay, next question, if another about Jain, is the fact.、Uh, 
the facts of Ahimsa of Pujapada different uh, from any other Jain Acharya? Is Pardon? It, yeah. Pardon? Yeah. So, so does actually Pujapada's view on Ahimsa differ um, significantly from other, uh, any other Jain Acharya? I think uh, in Jain also, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Say uh, Akalanka, uh, a commentator on Sarbata Siddhi, has not such a tendency. So, in a sense, Pujapada is um, uh, unique in Jain tradition in his in his day. But uh, later, say uh, Junya, uh, in Junyan Arunaba, yeah. We can find the same opinion as uh, Puja Pada said. Mm -hmm. So, in 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 Jaina tradition, uh, he may be uh, not so unique because oh. uh, later Jaina philosopher has a tendency of tan tantrism. Yeah, or uh, some people very eager to practice a yoga. Yoga. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, is, is that okay? Is that fine? Yeah, I think it's fine. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay, I think we have to to stop there and uh, wish you a really good night's sleep. Then after a long <laughs> Thank day. You. So, Thank you. And, uh, now I I um I is Peter there? Yeah. Okay. Fine, Peter. So should we have a cup of tea now and some good cookies or something? Yeah. I think we need uh, to. 15 yeah. minutes? 15 minutes, yeah. I think. I mean, we cannot avoid, uh, you know, some uh, overstretching of the program. <laughs> With no, this technology, no. it is impossible, really. So let me uh, introduce, without further ado, uh, Dr. Himal Trika, as you can see, from the University of Vienna, um, who uh, presents the paper 84 Lakyonis, the Jaina doctrine of 84 million embodiments. Very exciting topic. Well, yes, thank you, Peter. I hope you can see the visuals in a quite uh, in a, a wider extension. Now, um, I only see you, Peter. So please put off your microphone if possible. Thank you anyway for the invitation, and I'm grateful to you all uh, for virtually attending my talk. Um, I will first to illustrate the doctrine and secondly give an overview of its history in China text. Due to the restriction of time, I can refer to the correspondences in other ascetic traditions only in a short epilogue. A preprint of my full article on the topic is available at Academia EDU. In the context of our workshop, the doctrine concerns the object of Hinsa. This is basically an animated being, a soul, Jiva, which is believed to have been attracted to a particular place of origin, Yoni, a birthplace where it has to consume the results of previous actions, karma. The knowledge of the different types of birthplaces is essential if one wants to avoid harm against them. In the history of uh, Jainism, several classification schemes have been provided. Among the better known are, for example, the six groups of souls, which is attested as early as the Dasa Vijaya Sutta. The basic distinction of movable and immovable beings is enfolded into several classes, notably the Uttarajaya Sutta. Widespread are the four gatis of gods, demons, men, and remaining life forms. A late, elaborate version is found in Himachandra's Trishasti Shalaka Purusha Charitra. The doctrine of 84 Lakyonis reflects this alternative classification, but has a very specific purport. I illustrate it by an English rendering of the Satlak Sutra, the Sutra of 700,000. There are seven lakh places of origin for earth bodies, seven lakh water bodies, seven lakh fire bodies, seven lakh air bodies. Plants with a single body have 10 lakh, plants with common bodies 14. Beings with two senses have two luck, with three senses two, with four senses two. Heavenly beings have four luck, hellish beings four, 
animals was five senses, four luck, humans, 14 luck. In this way, there are 84 luck places of origin. Whatever harm I have done, caused to be done or approved of by mind, speech or body against all of them, may that harm be without consequence. According to court, this text is used twice daily by Shvetambara mendicants. Interesting for the team of our workshop is the last sentence. It is prayed that the rather relentless law of karmic retribution should be suspended somehow. I will not elaborate further on this, but focus on the structure and history of the classification. It is contended that there are 84 luck, that is 84 times 100,000 places of birth. Several classes of embodiments are mentioned. They are grouped here according to similar numbers distributed for each class. The elemental beings have seven luck divisions each, 20 luck in all. Beings with limited numbers of senses have two luck divisions each, six in all, etc. The sum total is 84 luck. In the overall scheme of the intellectual history of Jainism, two prominent themes are combined in this classification. The first is the central intention of Jainism to provide a path for individuals to enter the bondage to transmigration. The very high number 84 luck emphasizes the magnitude of the situation. An unimaginable number of life forms implies innumerable individual births, endless varieties of pains. When faced with this classification, one might think, stop that pain right now, avoid afflicting it to your countless fellows in misery, and thus pave the path for your individual liberation. The second theme is counting itself. The interest to measure and to classify a characteristic of many stages in Jaina intellectual history. This spirit for classification is applied here to grouping and subgrouping all thinkable forms of embodiments. The combination of these two prominent themes led to a very specific feature of the classification at hand. The sum total of life forms appears as if it would be an arithmetical figure, the result of an exact census. However, the number 84 luck figures not only as the sum total of types of embodiment, but realizes a pattern which was frequently applied to temporal spatial phenomena. In Jaina and other, other ascetic traditions, decimal multiples of 84 often represented some kinds of totality. This was recently presented here at the source by Rotsatinsky. Examples include the lifespans of Rishabha and other illustrious, illustrious persons, the height of Mount Meru, the number of places in hell, etc., etc. With regard to the history of the doctrine in question, we can therefore suppose a point in time when the pattern of totality was firstly applied to forms of embodiment. And when we can suppose a point in time when this general concept was rationalized, when it was shown how exactly the number of 84 luck would be achieved and that it represented the result of an accurate evaluation of the forms of life. In terms of the structural elements of the doctrine, we can thus distinguish between a pattern, the number 84 luck, and a classification that fits this pattern. In the second part of my paper, I will now address the slightly differing classifications of Shvetambara and Digambara. I have collected six early references to the doctrine in Shvetambara works. The table indicates the approximate datation. Besides the sole instance in the canon, there is one instance in the independent work Grihat Sangrahani by Jinnabhadra. The rest appear in commentaries by Sri Lanka, Sita Sena Gani, Abhayadeva and Malayagiri. The instance in the canon reads, the main places of birth are explained to be 8400,000. If there was in fact an early explanation, Panatha, of how this number should be arrived at, I did not find it in the vicinity of this text. Sections on Yonis in the Panavana Sutta or the Uttarajaya, Shubring Survey, Ohira Study, etc., no one cares to mention such a teaching in an early Shvetambara context. The Ayaranga simply states, the places of birth have many forms. 
The Bhagat Sangahani transmits the following scroll. Earth, water, fire and air beings have seven like places of origin each. Plants, single and endless ones, have ten and fourteen like places of origin. For beings with deficient senses, there are respectively two luck, and for infernal and heavenly beings, respectively four. Four for animals, for humans, however, 14. This is clearly an archetype of the classification in the Satlak Sutra. Exactly the same stuff appears with minor variations in Sri Lanka's Achara Anga Sutra Vibhriti and Abhaya Deva Samavaya Anga Tika. The question is, where does this classification come from? Chinabhadri certainly draw on earlier material while composing the stroph. But what about the characteristic segmentation of classes of life forms and particularly the sequence of the enumeration? I'm not sure, but I have two observations to make. Firstly, the 84 lakh pattern is not explicitly referred to in the context of the stroph in the Burhat Sangahana. All other Sri Tambara attestations of this classification do refer to the 84 lakh pattern. Was this pattern not yet prominent in Jinnabhadra's milieu? The second observation pertains to the first mention of the doctrine in Sri Tambara commentaries on the Tattva Atta Sutra. In about the 9th century, Siddha Senagani still wonders, Katam Yoni Lakshanam Ashitish Chatur Uttara Pratipadita. How, now, how are 84 lakh like places of origin explained with regard to class and the doctrine of Achana? It is as follows. Earth, water, fire and air have each respectively seven lakh like places of origin. And then the teaching and this uh, 84 lakh like classification continues. Um, Siddha Senegani has in fact occasion for surprise, as neither the Tattva Atta Sutra, nor Umas Vatispasya, nor the Tika, begun by a Haribhadra, refer either to 84 lakh pattern or to the classification at hand. There are no surprises for the Digambaras. The complete doctrine is a standard item in the explication of the Tattva Atta on the concept of Yoni, starting with Devanandin, the same as uh, Devanandin Pujapada, the famous commentators Akalanka, Vidyanandin, Vaskaranandin, and Shruta Sagarasuri all refer to it. Moreover, during a period of more than 1,000 years, the doctrine is exemplified by one and the same Arya stanza. Nichidara Dadu Sattaya, Tarudasa Vigalindi Esu, Chachiva, Sura Niraya Tiriya, Chauru, Chodasa Manue, Sadasahasa. The permanent and the other Nigodas and the four kinds of the element beings have 700,000 distinctions each, plants 10, beings with deficient senses exactly six, gods, demons and animals four, men 1,400,000. The scope and the purport of the highlighted numbers in this dancer is not at all evident. The translation follows the interpretation of all later commentators. A comparison of the two classifications shows that the same classes are addressed with different terms. There seems to be one exception concerning the Nigodas of the Vigambara list and the Sadarana in the Shvetambara list. For the Shubring and Padmanabh Jaini, however, this is also a difference in name only, as the Nigodas of the Vigambaras are subsumed under plants in other Shvetambara contexts. With this, we have the same segmentation of groups. The variation pertains to the sequence in enumeration only. From where did the Digambaras, the Gambara commentators obtain this classification? Probably from the Mula Chara. The stanza is transmitted in four independent bracket words, which are identified bracket words, the older of which are the Mula Chara and the Barasa Anureka. I consider the attestation in the Mula Chara to be older because Tripati and Vat excluded the stanza in question from their proposed original version of the Barasa Anureka. The context of the stanza in both old bracket works, however, has a very interesting detail to offer for the history of our doctrine. The 84 lakh pattern is not mentioned. 
the Munachara and the Barasanu Veka were only interested in the classification. And this classification was not yet considered in the 84 Luck framework. So in terms of identified textual attestations, we have 84 Luck pattern in the Samavayas Anga without detailed classification. The Shvetambara classification in the Brihat Sangrahani without the pattern. Likewise, the Digambara classification without the pattern in the Mula Achara. Pattern and classification and thus created a doctrine. I think it was Devanandin or one of his teachers, not two remote teachers. In his commentary on the Tatva Arta, the first attestation of the full doctrine reads The distinction of the places of birth, 8,400,000 in number, are to be known from the scriptures. And there it is said. The permanent and the Adonigodas and the four kinds of the element beings have 700,000 distinctions each. With this statement, Devanandin suggested that 8.4 million would be an arithmetical figure brought about by the calculation of numbers stated for these particular classes of units in this particular classification. Two traditions occur as a unity here. One that explicated the enormity of samsaric life with the 84 lap pattern, and another tradition that was dedicated to the examination of classes in details. From here, the combination spread and was to become a doctrine. Reconstructing the history of an idea on the basis of identified textual attestations is scratching the tip of an iceberg. The idea must have been much more alive than a handful of textual bits can reflect. The idea is very much alive today. This screenshot shows videos on the internet that treat it also in the concept of Sikhism and Vishnuism, notably Krishnaism. As far as I have seen, these classific the classification of these religions are congruent with that of neo sadant neo sadantika Shaivism of South India in about the 12th century. The tradition is close to Jainism for several reasons. This classification, anyway, is a distinct alternative to that of Jainism, and I think it would be a rewarding task to collect and analyze the attestations of the doctrine also in other traditions of classic and modern times. Thomas McEvely reaches out far into the other direction of the timeline. He proposed that the classification pattern of 84 is a heirloom of Sumerian astrology. The pattern would have gained the significance of temporal spatial totality because the number 84 is a product of the numbers 7 and 12. 7 would signify the seven planets, space in total. 12, the 12 relations of a year, time in total. This proposal is very convincing with regard to the initial symbolic significance of the pattern, but it needed to be shown how precisely the notion entered in the Indian scene. Wozatinsky follows Johannes Bronkhorst in assuming that the pattern is a heirloom of Greater Magadha, the culture to the east that was first independent from the full-fledged Aryan migration into the subcontinent. The number 84 would have played no role in Vedic literature, but was prominent with Buddhists, Chinas, and the Ajivikas, the initial inheritors of Magadha. In the context of this hypothesis, classification of life form would strengthen, again, the connection of Chinas and Ajivikas. Already Padmanam Chaini drew attention to the fact that what he called the Digambara classification of Yonis equals the number of aeons which every being has to pass before reaching salvation in the opinion of the Ajivika Goshana. There are two more striking parallels. 14 lakh, the number attributed to human yonis and jaina sources, equals the number of primary and primary embodiments, according to Goshana. Seven, the number attributed to Nigodas and element beings in the Mula Chara equals the classes of unconsciousness beings, earth from brass-like nodes, but also of men and God. Men and God. And these partly overlapping classific classifications point to variegated developments of beliefs that were initially shared by these ascetic groups. Against this backdrop, it is also understandable that these traditions agreed in applying the number 84 luck 
to pivotal um, doctrinal tenets. The common denominator for both applications is that the number meshes a framework which encompasses every phenomenal existence there is. In Gauchela's tradition, this framework is instantiated as the time in which an individual experiences phenomenal existence and after which this existence ends. For the Jainas, the framework points to all possible form of embodiments, a quintessentially animated phenomenal world, about which we have to be very careful if we want our individual embodiments ever to end. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Hima. Uh, a wonderful paper. I have the written version, of course, which is extraordinarily rich. Um, there's feedback here. Are there any questions? I think there was one in the chat by Suresh Parikh. Um, Surya Siddhanta is much older than Sumerian. Was this ignored? Or is our lack of knowledge about our ancient texts? Well, something like that. Yeah, in this case, one would have to. Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm not aware that Surya Siddhanta is uh, much older than Sumerian. One would have to, if one. Uh, um, would want to argue in that direction or would have to show that uh, the Sumerian astronomy of 2000 before, uh, before the Common Era would be in fact younger than Surya Siddhanta. As far as I know, this is, um, is not the case. It's the other way around. Sumerian is older than the Surya Siddhanta. Mm. And another question about self-evident truth or critical knowledge or some other hybrid form. You, you are asked to comment on game epistemology, please. I don't know how it co connects to your paper, but uh, there are no other questions right now. Well, the connection to China epistemology, I cannot, uh, for the moment I see uh, also no connection, uh, which I could highlight on here. Um, Uh, the only the only things that comes now to my mind uh, would be that uh, we are we are talking of different uh, of different classes of beings that all of them have different senses and um, the, it it would be for me it is an, it would be an interesting question what kind of um, epistemological faculties human humans and gods and narakas uh, demons would have with regard to the beings who have only five senses. Uh, but I, I fear this is not the background of the question. But if you want to write me, uh, Mr. Parikh, then I, I would be happy um, to see if I find uh, something that suits better to your question. Is there any more urgent question? If not, then... Uh... I had a question, Peter. Yes? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm not able to access the chat for some reason, or the Q&A box, but uh, I wondered um, if you saw any differences in the giant account of this from the others that you looked at. Yes, uh, as I mentioned, uh, so um, the, uh, the classification of the Jainas uh, seemed, to be, uh, seemed to be only in the context of the Jainas. Where, uh, whereas what was successful in the in the in the second millennium of our time was the um, was the classification of the Shaivas. So the classification of the Shaivas is the set days is congruent with the uh, classification found in the Vishnu Puranas, found in Sikhism, found in the Bhagavad, uh, Bhagavad Purana. I only look at this superficially, um, but this is another set of classification. But certainly they are they are the same in the sense that the that the number of classes of yonis in the end must be eighty four lakh. That's it. Yes, it's. Are there more questions? It's a very intriguing question. The, 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 the number eighty four. 
there is uh, some feedback. Maybe those who do not speak, uh, switch, please, uh, the phone off there, mute their microphone, then we're probably in a better place. I think we move on to the next paper. Thank you very much, Himal. We're looking forward to this appearing in print. Now, I would like to invite uh, Simon Wienand, uh, Simon Wienand, to talk about his paper, uh, Justifying Violence and Redistributing Blame, the implication of Deva Prabhasuri's narrative choices in the Pandava Charitra. Thank you, Peter, for uh, introducing me. Uh, can I share my screen with you all? Um, Hello, uh, thank you for um, being given this opportunity to present my paper, Justifying Violence, Deepna Vasuri's Narrative Choices in the Bandha Charita. Uh, my paper um, deals with um, how one particular Jain adaptation of the Sanskrit epic Mahabharata deals with the question of violence or how to adapt violence in its adaptation of the Virata Parvan episode. So as many of you will know, uh, the Mahabharata is one of the major Sanskrit epics. Uh, it's attributed to the sage Vyasa as its author and depicts the feud between two sets of cousins, the virtuous Pandavas and the villainous Kauravas over the rule of most of Northern India. Um, James too have adapted uh, uh, the narrative of uh, Mahabharata in many different types of works. And as a literary work on violence, like war, and um, conflicts. It is interesting to look at how James dealt with this uh, concept when they adapted uh, the epic. When James uh, have adapted this particular epic, epic they usually uh, included this narrative in the biography of the 22nd Tirthankar Nemi. Um, the text I am looking at is the Pandava Charita by De Prabhasuri, um, who was this Shwetambara monk from Gujarat, um, who was active around the 13th century and might have been affiliated with the Chaluki court. Uh, among many uh, literary works, he wrote, um, like most importantly, the Banav Chaita, a sizable work, about one tenth of the size of the of most uh, manuscripts of uh, the uh, Mahabharata epic, in 18 chapters, explicitly so as to mirror the 18 books of the Mahabharata. Why have I chosen this particular adaptation? Because it's arguably the first um, true Jain adaptation in Sanskrit to focus on the Pandava Charitas, as its title indicates. Hitherto, um, the, the Pandava's um, story was a sub-narrative in the Neminata uh, Charita, as I have mentioned before. Uh, with this, and there was one uh, adaptation the Ritanema which features the Pandava as its protagonist, but this is the first Sanskrit text. And what is particularly interesting is its uh, very deliberate faithfulness to the Vyasa Bharata, to an extent that is more than, than obvious, as I will demonstrate, as its adaptation of the Virata Bhavan in the Pandava Charita contains verbatim lines from the uh, um, Vyasa Bharata. And this faithfulness is very interesting um, with regards to uh, the violent elements in that episode, because um, Dev Rasui adheres to the narrative of Yas to a certain extent, but he also changes certain narrative elements that have to do with violence and how to justify violence, as I will explain later. So here's a brief overview of my presentation. So first I will give a brief um, synopsis of the Vedata Bhavan as depicted in the Mahabharata. Then I will go over the quotations, those verbatim lines in the Pan of Charita, uh, until finally moving on to the narrative changes in the Jain adaptation, namely the Pan of Charita. So uh, the Virata Parvan is the fourth uh, book of Mahabharata. So after uh, the five Pandavas are defeated uh, at the fatal game of dice against their cousins, the Kauravas, they are forced to go into exile together with their wife Draupadi um, for, th for 13 years. 
The first 12 years are spent in the forest, but the 13th year has to be spent in public, but unrecognized. So uh, to that end, the Pandavas disguise themselves um, uh, and live at the court of King Virasa, the king of the Matsyas. So uh, Yudhishthira, this, the eldest Pandava, this is himself up as a gambling Brahmin. Uh, Bhima becomes a cook and wrestler called Nalava, and uh, Draupadi uh, is um, um, uh, dressed herself as a uh, traveling maidservant uh, uh, of the type they call uh, Sairandhi. Um, uh, they spend a couple of months uh, in relative ease without too many uh, troubles until uh, the end of their stay when um, the brother-in-law of King Virata, um, Kichika, uh, spots Draupadi, becomes obsessed with her and wants to seduce her. So um, he asks his sister, Queen Sudeshna, to send um, Draupadi to his apartments on a pretext, which uh, Sudeshna does. Draupadi arrives at the, uh, at the Kichika's uh, apartments, uh, where, upon which Kichika tries to pro proposition her. She refuses. Um, she runs away uh, for shelter, uh, but he uh, pursues her and kicks her in front of uh, her husband's Bhima and Yudhishthira and King Virata himself. Um, the enraged Bhima is restrained by uh, uh, Yudhishthira, and unfortunately, uh, neither Virata nor um, Yudhishthira are, are willing to punish Kichika. So uh, Draupadi um, is forced to resort to Bhima for um, moral support, and Bhima comes up with a plan to uh, get rid of Kichika. Draupadi is to uh, pretend she uh, is in love with Kichika and arrange a nightly rendezvous at a uh, secluded uh, location. But instead of Draupadi, it is Bhima who waits upon Kichika, and when Kichika arrives, he kills him in a gruesome fa fashion. He reduces him to a lump of flesh. Um, after word of Kichika's death has gotten around, um, Kichika's brothers, the Upa Kichikas, um, desire to um, revenge themselves upon Draupadi, whom they blame for Kichika's demise, and they abduct her in attempt to uh, burn her alive. Again, it is Bhima who comes to her rescue, and again, Bhima slays all Kichika's brothers. The rest of Virata Parvam is um, dedicated to uh, the cattle raid by the Kauravas on the Nazi kingdom. I will not discuss this uh, part in my section, in my paper. So interestingly, interestingly the Pandava Charita um, contains, as I've said, verbatim lines that I found in uh, Vyasa Bharat. So it is very clear that Deva Prabhasuri must have used a manuscript of the Vyasa Bharata or um, must have been at any rate very intimately aware with that particular text. So before the Pandavas um, in the Mahabharata set out for the uh, Mats Matsya kingdom, they first consult with their house priest, Dhanya, who gives them a speech on how to behave at a king's court. Uh, in the Pandava Charita, this same speech occurs, but is given by Yudhishthira instead to his younger brothers. And nearly all of the lines by Yudhishthira are inspired by uh, by um, Dhamma's speech, and three consecutive lines are almost directly taken from Mahabharata, as I will show. So on the left, I've given the line from Mahabharata. On the right, uh, uh, the, the line in the Pandava of the Chaita. So what man honored by the wise will wish ill to him whose anger inflicts great pain and whose favor bears great fruit. As you can see, the line on the right um, is a statement that Apart from very minor adjustments, it's almost identical. I will show the Sanskrit quote uh, line that I've, line I've translated uh, now. The consecutive next line from the Pāṇava Charita is also um, found yeah, of a verbatim in the Mahārāyata. For kings are displeased with people who lie. Likewise, they despise a minister who speak, speaks falsely. Again, the line of the Pāṇava Charita is also very similar. Uh, apart from some minor adjustments. The minister uh, could argue 
that it's because the, the Sanskrit word um, ma, manin, like thinking, Panita, one who thinks himself clever, uh, could have been a corruption from um, Mantirinan. Mantirin, manin, they but have equal metrical weight. So perhaps that's the reason why uh, that, that has been a change. The next line of Anuchata again is inspired by uh, Mahabhata. Here I have, haven't given the line from um, the critical edition, but the line found in the most northern manuscript because it's even closer. So again, it's only the latter part, um, like live in the king's palace and may attain the favor of the king that actually differ. Um, there are other uh, um, in, uh, um, examples of um, near quotations and tiny details that can only be explained by um, um, actual manuscript knowledge uh, in the, the Panavichaita, uh, Vyatapavan, but I will skip it for now because I think it's sort of clear that from these examples that are given that Dev Prabhasui must have known the Mahabharata quite well and tried to write a text that's at that's, some level tries to echo and mirror the Mahabharata. So now we'll go on to um, the alterations and narrative changes. So um, Contrary, like uh, contrary. Well, um, despite containing like almost verbatim lines, uh, Deva Basuri does not really slavishly adhere to the uh, the Mahabharata, and he actually uh, introduces certain changes in the theater by them, subtle changes which uh, relate to violence for the most part. They either tone down the willingness and the eagerness of the the, the violence. Uh, Bhima and Draupadi inflicts, they justify some of the, the violence acts or try to justify at a certain level. And Deva Prabhupada even invents, invents or reimagines a certain episode from Mahabharata to uh, provide a contrast, like a, an, an analog between the justified violence Bhima inflicts on Ichika and an unjust other example, as I will indicate. Um, for instance, the slaying of Kichika in the Mahabharata is depicted as a very extended duel between uh, Abhima and Kichika, and the narrative really focuses on the, the gruesome death of Kichika. And uh, as opposed to the Bhandacharita, where there's no real duel and Kichika is killed instantly, and they don't really focus on the actual, don't focus as much uh, on the, the actual violence as opposed to the one Mahabharata. So um, Kichika is killed instantly. Uh, I will read out Lan. Whilst Kichika was speaking thus, Wolf Belly, Bhima that is, came up to him and embraced him so affectionately that he died. The son of the wind, Bhima, then through Kichika, whose body was reduced to a lump of flesh through the window out of the room, the, just out of the, out of the dance hall onto the ground. Uh, What's interesting, like in Mahabharata, Bhima, Bhima actually shows Kichika's corpse to uh, Draupadi. And um, Draupadi herself uh, is overjoyed at Kichika's death in Mahabharata and even rejoices and calls in the, the palace guards to gaze upon Kichika's mangled corpse. And this is completely absent in uh, the uh, Pandavacharita. Bhima goes to, as soon as he's killed Kichika, he's go, he goes to the kitchen. Uh, Draupad is not even near the crime scene, and she doesn't gloat and rejoice in the, the violent aftermath of Kichika's death. Um, another element where the violence sort of toned down is the, the episode of the, the Kichika's brothers, the Kipupa Kichikas. In the Mahabharata, as well as in the Pandava Charita, uh, the Kichika's brothers abduct Draupadi for their holder responsible for Kichika's death. Uh, in Mahabharata, because uh, um, it is because uh, uh, Draupadi itself actually uh, claimed responsibility, whereas in the Panavacharita, it's because they reason Kichika was in love with uh, Draupadi, so she must have been uh, responsible for his death. And what happens in the Mahabharata, uh, Bhima hears Draupadi screams, he comes to a rescue. Uh, as soon as the, the Upakichikas see uh, Bhima approach, they release Draupadi but Bhima has no mercy and uh, slays them all with an uprooted tree. Whereas in the Bhima Charita, 
Behemoth hears Dirkly screams, runs up to them, and tries to reason with them first before engaging in violence. So, for instance, this quote in, from the Thanavi Charita is said to them, Ho, why are you dragging this woman away to, uh, against her will? Why isn't her husband around here somewhere? The, uh, the Upekichikas um, say that they want to uh, incinerate, like burn the Dirkly to death, upon which Kichi, uh, Bhima speaks like, why don't you fear that sinful act of killing that woman? You would gain another crime, you would commit another crime and you would not gain anything by it. So um, again, he tries to appeal to their sense of decency, he doesn't immediately re resort to violence. And it, it isn't until the, the Upekichikas actually ask them, um, refuse to uh, uh, let Dirkly go, that Beam is forced to resort to violence. They, then they answer, let someone who has strength and anger in his strong arms rescue the one we want to throw on the funeral pile, 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 pile uh, which is a derpy. So their response basically amount to come try and stop us. And it's only then that Beam actually kills them all. Another narrative change uh, found in the Ban of the Charita is um, um, the reimagined duel uh, of Bhima and Jimuta, found in the uh, Mahabharata, uh, as compared to the duel between Bhima and Vishakarpara. So in the Mahabharata, in the, the couple of months the Pandavas spend in Vyasa's uh, service, Bhima is not only employed as a cook, but also as a wrestler. And King Virata has this great wrestling festival um, at some point in the narrative, uh, where he has Bhima fight all these wrestlers, including one certain certain wrestler called Jimuta, whom Bhima defeats. This sort of episode is sort of reimagined and uh, inserted at a later point in the narrative in the Pandava Charita, after the death of the Kichika and the Upekichikas. And this is um, in relation to Sudeshna's rage in the Pandava Charita. So Sudeshna is the wife of King Virata, and sister to uh, Kichika and the Upekichikas. So in the Mahabharata, Sudeshna is remarkably indifferent to her brother's death and her kinsman's death. Whereas in the Banavichaita, she's actually insulted and angry, uh, which is, would be a more no normal or natural reaction. And this is clearly sort of a narrative invention by Dev Um So, uh, upon uh, in the Pandava Charita, Sudeshna comes up to the, the king, King Virata, and uh, proclaims like uh, Bhima's killing of a uh, k uh, kinsman, the Upekichikas, is a sort of a, an insult, and he uh, asks him to uh, avenge Bhima. So Virata at first refuses because he thinks uh, Bhima's way is strong for me to openly uh, attack, but uh, he comes up with a ruse, with a subterfuge to kill, uh, uh, to kill uh, Bhima. What's interesting uh, too is that um, Sudeshna, in a uh, plea to Virata to kill uh, Bhima, Bhima or Balada, his alter ego, um, is that she sort of emotionally blackmails him with the threat of suicide. And that is very similar to the, the threat of suicide that Draupadi makes in the Mahabharata when she asks Bhima to kill uh, Kichika. So it's almost like out of that desire for vengeance, it's sort of transposed from Draupadi onto Sudeshna. And now this is a Sanskrit uh, line, which I've translated in the previous slide. And the ploy uh, Virata comes up with is um, um, to use this wrestler, Vishikarpa, who happens to have been sent by uh, Duryodhana, the rival of the Pandavas to, uh, to um, the Matsya kingdom. And he argues that there was certainly, that they should have a duel between Balava and Bhima, and because Vishakarpa is a very well-trained wrestler, surely Bhima should, be, um, should not be able to uh, defeat uh, Vishakarpa, and um, the uh, sedation's lust for revenge will be satisfied. Uh, it's interesting that the narrative uh, continually focuses between the, the fact that um, Jacarpe has been trained in wrestling, whereas Bhima 
is not. Um, it's not supposed to be a fair fight. Uh, if it weren't that Bhima is just like on account of being a Pandava, just be incredible, incredibly powerful uh, uh, hero and human being. So the king Virat has a stage built, uh, and there is this contest between Vishakarpada uh, uh, and Bhima, and Bhima managed to defeat Vishakarpada, uh, and um, um, King Virat decides to um, to let go of his. Um, uh, plans to uh, satisfy his wife's wishes and uh, he tells her to um, to not uh, no longer pursue uh, Kichikis, uh, uh, Bhima's uh, death. So it's, um, I would argue that it's sort of like a, an analog of a um, sort of a mirror of Bhima's and Draupadi's ruse to kill Kichika uh, uh, that is found in this uh, Vishakarpada and um, um, Bhima um, a duel. So uh, a woman uh, who has been insulted asks her husband to uh, kill uh, her tormentor. And include um, and the interesting thing is that um, the one is uh, one incident is, is justified because uh, Kichika has, has really uh, trans transgressed uh, as a committed a moral offense. And Bhima himself comes up with a list, with, 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 a, with, a, with a ruse, um, but he himself offers him up as the instrument of retribution. He himself will uh, fight Kichika, whereas uh, in uh, Firatis, uh, uh, ruse, he uh, uses an, uh, an unwitting form who doesn't really know he's been used to, to uh, fight uh, another person's battle. And I think it's sort of, uh, deliberately uh, created by um, uh, Dev Brasui to sort of justify Bhima and um, Draupadi's, uh, Bhima's um, killing of Kichika. Um, uh, especially since uh, in the Banavichaita, the protagonists are supposed to be Jain characters. They're supposed to be Jain persons who uh, w w worship the Jinnas. So how do you deal with um, the violence that they inevitably uh, commit in, 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 in this adaptation? So I think these um, toning down, like these attempts to tone down the eagerness of violence or not, not dwell on the violence and give a, a worse exa example of unjustified violence makes the Banavas come across, make Banavas come across better. And that is uh, my uh, presentation and paper. And um, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Simon. That was uh, fabulous. And it just shows uh, what great work is being done in Ghent, particularly on uh, narrative literature. And uh, Dharamchand Jain raised the hand. Please, Dharamchand. Is Dharamchand asking a question? You have to unmute yourself. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. What positive point do you see in Pandav Charit? And what is the intention of writer of Pandav Charit, Dev Prabhsuri, for, uh, for depicting this slain by Bhim of Kichak? What is the intention of Dev Prabhsuri? Was he not a, a non-violent person? Or is there any intention of showing this uh, incidents? Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Dhanuchand. Um, I personally think uh, that that Dev Prabhasui wants to balance, like to strike a balance between like adapting the the, the like the, the confidence of Mahabharata. It, it's not he might have written for an audience that goes beyond the Jain audience. So he wants to stay true to a certain parts of the Mahabharata narrative. But at the same time he wants to uh, tone down some parts of the violence. But the Kishika Vada is such a, a central episode and such a often adapted uh, part, and it's found in, in many forms of Indian culture, in Katakali performances, in uh, probably even in, in some lost plays and, and folk drama. So he feels this necessity to uh, depict the slaying of Kichike. He feels like as if he can't deviate. I mean, there have been, uh, there is one Jain adaptation, early Jain adaptation that depicts uh, Bhima having mercy upon Kichike, not killing him, but that is not uh, the dominant depiction in Jain adaptations especially now in this one, 
which tries to be even closer to um, the Mahabharata, most Jain adaptations of Mahabharata. So I think um, uh, Deva Prabhasu, he must have felt he could not depict uh, uh, like a non, non-violent end to Kichika. And I think that's my answer. There are two more hands. I cannot see who raised the hand, but on my screen, but please speak up. Maybe the hands were withdrawn. No, I can't see any hands either. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Well, in that case, uh, uh, thank you very much, Simon. Um, we are moving on to Julie Hanlon's paper, which is uh, on nonviolence, nonviolence in stone and clay, the consideration of Jane Lithic inscriptions, relief images, and ceramic vessels. Great, thank you so much. Okay. Um, so, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here this afternoon. Uh, it's Chicago time. Um, my name is Julie Hanlon. Um, I'm from the University of Chicago. And today I'll talk a little bit about um, my contribution, which is on nonviolence in stone and clay, a consideration of Jain lithic inscriptions, relief images, and ceramic vessels. So a little bit about the overview of the paper. Um, in this chapter, I examine three categories of Jain material culture. Um, this includes lithic inscriptions, stone relief images, and ceramics, and specifically within the context of Jain monastic hill sites in the Pandya region between the 3rd century BCE and the 10th century CE. Um, this region is of particular importance as Madurai, which was the capital city of the Pandyas, was an important center of early Jainism in South India, um, not only uh, during uh, some of the earliest periods, um, but also up through the early medieval period. So I highlight uh, the forms and features of various inscriptions, stone relief images, and ceramics, and elaborate on the process of their creation. I also explore the ways in which these creative processes may be classified um, as violent based on the content of early Jain Agamas and writings of medieval Jain scholars. In doing so, I aim to draw attention to the archaeological history um, of Jain material culture in Tamil Nadu and the interesting contrast that seems to exist between the violence or himsa inherent in the creation of these artifacts and the vows of nonviolence, ahimsa, taken by Jain monastics and laity. There are approximately 89 Jain inscriptions in Tamil Rami and 180 inscript Jain inscriptions in Vartartha script um, spread across 36 sites in Tamil Nadu. The majority of Tamil Brahmi inscriptions, uh, which may be dated, um, the Jain ones that is between around 3rd century BCE to 5th century CE, are found in Madurai district and associated with caves and rock shelters uh, that were once used by the Jain ascetics as monsoon retreats. And so you can see the clustering around Madurai here. And in this map here, the, the red is the Tamil Brahmi and the blue is the Vacharitha. So you can see that there's this cluster there. These Tamil Brahmi inscriptions, uh, some of which identify them, the caves as Pali or monasteries are found engraved on both the exterior and interior surfaces um, of the caves. And of the named donors in the inscriptions, um, uh, a good portion, um, about 22 of them, can be identified as the donors as merchants or merchant guilds. Um, so from a very early period, uh, merchants were actively involved as, as donors in these relationships. Many of the hill sites uh, bearing Tamil Brahmi inscriptions continued to be occupied or were reoccupied by Jain monastics in the early medieval period, as evidenced by the presence of stone relief images and Vakdartha inscriptions um, but there the script was predominantly used in the Pandya region, um, which is a kind of roughly circled it here, the sort of southern region of Tamil Nadu, 
um, between the 5th and 11th century CE, with the majority of inscriptions in Vajrayatha occurring between the 7th and 9th centuries. The content of Jain Vajrayatha inscriptions suggests a shift in the composition of the Jain laity in Tamil Nadu between the early historic and the early medieval periods, with women appearing more frequently as donors, um, as well as uh, a higher percentage of donations being associated with specific Jain monastics and their students. Um, so we see this, this rise in the um, appearance of Jain monastics and their students, and you can really sort of see the growing um, of, of uh, the Jain community in these inscriptions. Um, while the content of the Tamil Brahmi and Vajrayatha inscriptions provide a fair amount of information regarding early, his, early Jain monastic communities and the donors that supported them, information regarding the individuals who carved these inscriptions is lacking. However, by reconstructing the creative processes for carving inscriptions, it becomes evident that the stonemasons who carve these inscriptions most likely belonged to an emerging a uh, class of emerging and professional artisans distinct from the lady whose donations are recorded in the inscriptions and the Jain monastics who were the recipients of these gifts. So a little bit about the process um, of what went into carving these inscriptions. Many of the Jain inscriptions are carved on metamorphic charnakites and granites. So granite is an exceptionally difficult stone to work with um, because of its hardness, which is between a seven, uh, is a seven out of 10 on the most hardness scale. Um, and also as a metamorphic rock, it has interwoven grains, which when you uh, try to beat it can shatter um, often in unpredictable ways, making it difficult to carve. Um, so to carve an inscription into granite requires more than just simple iron tools because of, of how hard the stone is. Um, instead, the tools must be tempered uh, to increase their hardness. So iron resources um, abound throughout much of South India, and archaeological evidence suggests that craftsmen uh, in the South began experimenting with carburizing um, iron from a very early date. So we have archaeological evidence from both Karnataka and Kerala of, of, of early sort of Wootz steel experimentations. The form and features of the Tamil Brahmi inscriptions suggest that they were strategically carved upon flattened surfaces. So um, here uh, in the upper left, I have um, a picture from um, Therupurankundram. So uh, this is where it was sort of cut. So this is already sort of flattened by the act of cutting these beds. Um, and here also, and then uh, this is sort of the flat space um, on the front of the cave at Vikramangalam. So these are the, the Tamil Brahm, examples of Tamil Brahm inscriptions. Um, while the Vajrayatha inscriptions are predominantly carved upon um, prepared stone surface. So in this example from um, uh, Karugamalai, you can see, right, uh, uh, hopefully a little bit in the, in the image, you can see that there's clearly a prepared surface here. Um, you can even see sort of the faint line there where a real, a box has sort of been smoothed away to pre prepare space for that inscription. Um, uh, and surprisingly, um, obviously, the later Vajrayatha inscriptions um, show better control over the sizing of letters, uh, spacing, etc., as well as increased linguistic complexity and standardization in their content. However, even within the Tamil Brahmi inscriptions, um, uh, those from um, Mangalam and Pugalur, which reference the Pandian and Chara kings respectively, are superior uh, in quality um, and do I have a, yes, I do. Uh, are superior in quality um, and complexity. So this is a very long um, inscription from Mangalam. And you can see, you know, even uh, this is dated around like third to second century BCE. Um, we have very clear uh, individual letters. So this, this required quite a bit of control um, to pull off this feat. Um, so these differences suggest that these elite donors had access likely uh, to a professional class of scribes and stonemasons, even at this early date. Um, by the medieval period, we know um, that there was differentiation of professional craftsmen um, and classes of apprentice and master craftsmen who differed both in skill and socioeconomic status. 
Um, and these are well documented in Hindu temple inscriptions and thus um, in the Vajrayana inscriptions as well, uh, the Jain ones from medieval Jain hill sites were likely similarly carved um, by these specialized craftsmen. Um, what's interesting is that it has been posited that the Jain monks may have played some role in the carving of these early inscriptions. Um, and sometimes it's sort of fuzzy as to whether um, there's some kind of implication of donors engaging actively in, in the carving. Uh, of these things. Um, however, as I will discuss, um, the violence inherent in the creation of these engravings um, seriously suggests otherwise. So within the major uh, vows observed by Jain monastics and the minor vows observed by Jain laity, uh, as we all know, uh, the vow of nonviolence or ahimsa is paramount. Uh, for the monastics, uh, this vow is all encompassing and applies to all forms of life, no matter how small. For the lady, this ideal becomes equipoise with constraints of daily life, but nevertheless entails a commitment to deliberately avoid and minimize harm. So, for example, harm that results from one's profession or arambaja himsa can be minimized by choosing a profession, uh, a, a nonviolent profession. To guide Jain laity in choosing nonviolent professions, Svetambara preceptors in the medieval period crafted lists of trades to be avoided, and such restrictions were similarly adopted by the Digambaras. The engraving of inscriptions requires, as I just sort of explained a little bit, the, the mining of ore, the cutting of rock, both of which may be classified um, as, as sort of activities related to hewing and digging, um, uh, Spota Carmen, uh, which is included among the 15 forbidden trades. More directly and definitively more violent and destructive are the processes associated with the creation of these tempered iron tools, um, which were necessary to engrave uh, these inscriptions upon the granite and other metamorphic rocks. So smelting and refining metals and metalworking in general um, are among the forbidden trades related to the use of charcoal or Angara Carmen. Um, and this prohibition is unsurprising as the furnaces that enable the extraction of ore, um, of the iron from the ore, require large amounts of charcoal. And this often leads to um, not only lots of smoke, but also uh, considerable deforestation um, in the creation of this charcoal. Metalworking also results in piles of accumulated debris, included slag, discarded crucibles, ceramic fragments, um, and some of these piles of, of ancient um, furnaces can still be seen on the surface um, today at, at various archaeological sites in South India. Um, and the extremely high temperatures of the furnaces are, of course, um, deadly. So turning to the Jan, uh, the early medieval Jan stone relief images, while there is textual evidence um, uh, to suggest that image worship may have been part of Jain religious practice in South India during the early centuries CE. The earliest extant stone relief images generally date to around the 7th or 8th century CE. Most of these images are carved in low relief, um, meaning they do not project significantly from the background and do not feature any undercuts. Um, more detailed images um, in medium uh, to high relief, so with undercuts, um, can be found at sites like Karagamalai. So none um, of any of these images uh, featured here provide uh, include undercuts, right? So there's no um, the the sculptor didn't actually have to like go and create um, open spaces behind the body so that the body or the the image is comes out from um, the stone. Instead. Um, the edges of, of the figures hit the stone. So this is all in sort of low relief. Um, such, uh, okay, yes. Um, so these, these stone relief images, um, which began emerging uh, in South India and in Tamil Nadu in particular, around the seventh or eighth centuries, um, some of these are found at Jain hill sites, which earlier had those Tamil Brahmi inscriptions, and they also emerge at new hill, Jain hill sites and temples um, that were also starting to sort of uh, flourish during this period. We have this sort of um, large increase 
um, in, the, in the presence of uh, these inscriptions in the record. So while most of the Jay and Stone relief images are accompanied by inscriptions identifying the donor who, who financed the carving of the image, again, uh, the artisans who crafted these works are rarely, if ever, um, identified. So the Jay and Stone relief images discussed in the paper, um, so I, I talk about a lot of different uh, images, but they generally fall into one of three categories. Um, so one are the elevated large scale images, and those are images um, uh, that could have been seen far at a distance, and they generally measure over one meter tall. Um, so this is an example of, of one of those categories from um, Chetty Bordabu at Samara Malai. Um, a moderately sized relief images under one meter in length and clusters of Jain images associated with water tanks. So this is an example from Pechipalam, and these are sort of the moderately sized, less than around 0.5 meters tall. So um, from these examples, I would like to highlight here a group of six Jain relief images carved roughly at eye level on the side of a boulder at Kilavalavu. Um, so uh, these, this group includes four um, uh, nondescript, that is unidentifiable or undifferentiated uh, seated jinnas, um, as well as identifiable images of Parshvanath here with the, the hooded cobra, and as well as what appears to be um, a standing figure of uh, Gomateshvara. What's very interesting about this group of figures is the remains of plaster um, on two of these images, um, one of which has also retained really beautiful red, green, and gold painting. So that's this picture here. Um, the association of jade images, uh, so th this is somewhat, on, I'll return to this um, in a minute. The association of Jain images with water tanks is also something um, that I found uh, quite interesting. So these tanks, um, which are located at the Jain hill sites in Tamil Nadu around Madurai, would have provided water for travelers and devotees who visited the Jain hill sites, and the images engraved above them communicate a clear association between these water features and the Jain monastics who resided there. For example, at Samanarmalai, a series of eight relief images are carved upon above a rock cut tank uh, located, um, sorry, at a rock cut tank known as Pechipalam. So this is the Pechipalam from Samanarmalai. And a similar series of three Jain relief images appear above a rock cut tank located at the base of Thiruparangundram Hill. And then another set of Jain relief images, these up in the top corner, are visible above a water tank that runs along um, an elevated terrace near the summit of Thiruparangundram. So much like the carving of lithic inscriptions, the carving of relief images uh, begins with identifying a location for the image and surface preparation. However, unlike inscriptions, which can be carved say in a day's time, um, the carving of relief images uh, by nature requires a high degree of skill and planning um, and execution and certainly progresses much, much slower. It's a laborious operation that requires strength and diligence. You know, you're actually physically hammering um, this, this stone and the sculptor must proceed very carefully to avoid making an irrevocable error. Uh, that could ruin the image. Um, moreover, because many of these images um, are in elevated locations, um, so these, this is in a somewhat elevated location, but you'll see some of the other ones, um, for example, the one at uh, Samaramalai, they would have also have required, you know, elaborate sort of scaffolding to support the, the sculptor as they, um, you know, definitely ex executed their work. The sculptor then proceeds, you know, uh, progressively roughing out the, and removing the layers of stone using a point. Uh, again, this, these tempered iron points, punch or, or, or hammer. Um, and such initial stages are still visible um, in unfinished relief images at sites like Karagomalai. So here you can see this is an unfinished image up here. And this image is also unfinished here. And then these two images lack inscriptions. These two images um, are finished, but only one of the two has an inscription. 
Um, as the work progresses, the sculpture transitions to finer picks and chisels to contour and add details, and they finish the image using some kind of abrasive, such as a metal fire file or a coarse uh, grain stone to smooth out the cuts. Um, now, the remains of pigment and plaster on medieval Jain images, as I just highlighted a moment ago, suggest that the Tamil artisans may have also finished their uh, sculptures by applying a thin layer of plaster followed by the painting, which contributed to the details of the image. With coarser stones, partic particularly um, metamorphic rocks, um, applying a paste would have also helped conceal irregularities um, in the color and texture of the stone. Because natural pigments are uh, by nature highly perishable, much of this detail work um, has been lost. You know, it's, it's very sort of rare to sort of see this. Um, uh, with only bits and pieces were preserved um, here and there uh, in carved recesses um, and niches. Notably, however, it is barely common to see a line of holes. Um, not this one, which um, is modern, but this one here, um, these sort of square holes um, that are often carved above the Jain images. So these holes would have once held um, large wooden beams that again with other forms of organic material would have formed a canopy um, to protect these images from the elements. And such canopies would have also served to protect the painted surfaces as well. Um, today, these holes remain empty and the stone relief images beneath them, you know, bereft of any surface treatments or decoration um, or in many cases, protection from the elements. Sorry. The violence inherent in the production of Jain relief images is similar to that of inscriptions, but to a greater detail. That is, the shallow incisions necessary to engrave an inscription are smaller and less destructive than the cuts required to carve a relief image. In both cases, the artisan is required to temper their tools in high heat and regularly sharpen them to maintain their effectiveness. Thus, for a sculptor in early medieval um, or ancient India, um, certainly some basic knowledge of metal smithing um, and the ability to execute this and uh, harden one's own tools, um, which is one of the forbidden trades, uh, is required. The act of cutting stone is also highly strenuous, um, and the verbs used to describe the process in both English and in Tamil are the same as those um, used for physical violence. So to scratch or kiru, cut, kote, strike, vekte, beat, adi. Um, the, uh, although Jain inscriptions tell us very little about the identity of the sculptures who carved these stone images, the strenuous physical labor, the use of iron tools, the destruction of rock, would have certainly precluded um, uh, a Jain monk or nun from carrying out this work. And the fact that stonemasons and sculptors um, must quarry rock regularly and temper their metal tools may have also deterred Jain laity from taking up these professions. So finally, turning to the last part is the um, uh, ceramics from Jain hill sites. So in the summer of 2016, I conducted an archeological survey of six Jain hill sites along the Nagamalai hill range, um, northwest of Madurai. So here's Madurai and these are the sites. All six had evidence of Tamil Brahmi inscriptions and rock cut beds. And four of the six sites also bore evidence of Jain images and Vakarita inscriptions. Ceramics that could be stylistically dated to the early historic and medieval periods were observed on the surface of all six sites. Um, so this is just from surface observations, uh, and I explain a little bit about uh, how surface ceramics are formed in the paper. So shirts from a variety of vessels uh, could be identified, though jars were most commonly identified, um, and this is because jars are often thicker, right, and so they're more durable, so they're more likely to be uh, sort of overrepresented in, in surface samples. Um, the most common ceramic wares observed at the JM sites included red plain ware, red slipped and polished ware, black slipped and polished ware, and black and red ware. And of particular interest was the observation of bowl shirts uh, of black slipped and polished ware and black and red ware um, that could be stylistically dated to the early historic period. So this is one example of sort of uh, black slipped and polished ware. I posit that such shirts, such, such shirts found at Jain monastic hill sites may represent the remains of alms bowls, which are described in the Acharanga Sutra um, from fourth to third century BCE, and in greater detail in the later Cheda Sutras in their Yuktis. 
So according to the Ogre Nyrkti, composed around 7th to 8th century, an ideal pot was perfectly round, well polished, and was exclusively used by the monk to whom it was bestowed. The Jain Agama suggests that monks were responsible for maintaining the surface treatment of the, the ceramics they used. In particular, great attention was paid to the oiling and polishing of alms bowls, and monks were required to inspect them daily as part of Pradilekana, so the inspection of the clothing and utensils. This Jain monastic practice of coating the alms bowl aimed to reduce the porosity of the vessel, thereby rendering the food within the bowl untainted by the residue of its earlier contents. So this basically you know, made, made the, the um, bowls water resistant and they wouldn't sort of absorb the um, food oils and things like that. While polishing a bowl is a rather passive practice, the production of the ceramic vessels themselves entails uh, a great deal of violence um, on multiple levels. Um, from the coring of the clay, to the beating and shaping of the vessel, uh, to the firing of the vessel in a kiln. Moreover, uh, kilns produce a great deal of very thick smoke. Um, and this is why many of these early, uh, very often even today, these kiln areas are generally located uh, far on the outskirts of the villages. Um, and this thick smoke can be harmful, obviously, to air bodies, as well as to humans and other animals who are breathing the air. Uh, the violence of the potter's craft is creatively conveyed um, in this passage uh, from the Boja Prabandha, which I enjoy very much, um, a Sanskrit text composed around the, uh, the 11th century um, and dedicated uh, to the king, the Rajput king Boja. So in it, the personified pot cries out to King Boja, seeking justice for the harm uh, that has befallen him. And uh, so I'll just read this. The potter digs me with his axe and makes me ride on a donkey. So that would have been you know, in the clay stage when he's been um, uh, extracted from the ground. Then the wretched potter beats me mercilessly with his feet and rotates me on the wheel with a stick. So that's the shaping and forming of the vessel. He cuts me with a string, right? So when they're cutting the clay, he beats me and bakes me. So that's the, the shaping out of the vessel with paddles and putting in the kiln. All these I bear with patience. Further, the ladies of the village incessantly tap me with their fingers to test my quality, which I can no longer bear. So that tapping is something you can even do today. So how highly fired uh, a ceramic is, you can actually hear it in the tinkling. So if you tap it and it makes a sort of a higher sound, it's been highly fired, um, a low sound and it's, it's thick and, and lower fired. Um, so to conclude, um, overall, the violent nature of the artistic and material processes entailed in the creation of Jain lithic inscriptions, stone relief images, and ceramic vessels clear, uh, suggest very clear distinctions between the artisans who produce these material artifacts and the Jain lay donors and Jain monastic recipients. In closing, I argue that it's important to consider how these categories of Jain material culture were created and by whom. Um, as a way to really try to get at reconstructing the life histories of these objects, right? How were they made? Who made them? How were they used? Who's how were they traded? Um, and what, what was their life prior to us either finding them, um, in this case, on the side of a hill in southern Tamil Nadu or uh, for other kinds of artifacts um, buried in the ground? Reconstructing the life histories of objects in turn may elucidate the social and economic, uh, and economic relationships connecting Jay and Lay and monastic communities to the larger societies and cultures in which they were historically and geographically situated. So thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. That was absolutely fabulous. And this last image is wonderful. <laughs> yes. Um, are there any questions for Julie? Bryony. Hi, Julie, thanks. I, I wondered if you had any thoughts about, um, well, is this sense that sometimes harms could be justified if they served uh, some kind of religious purpose? And I was especially interested in the water tanks, um, wondering about, like, what, was there like purposes in terms of um, 
offering a, an image of uh, a kind of a greater truth, but also serving maybe travelers. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on that in terms of the, that particular area? Yes. Um, so with regard to the, the first comment, um, I also sort of play around with this idea in the paper as well. You know, so for example, um, JN donors did um, obviously commission many of, of these sculptures, um, which by commissioning them, thereby, you know, set in motion all of these other kinds of violent harm. And as you said, um, when something is done um, with sort of a higher purpose, and also this would also apply certainly to the digging of water tanks as well, um, this can sort of offset that violence. Um, with regard to the, the water tanks and their use, these were, I think I might have skipped over the paragraph perhaps, but um, these water tanks, due to their location, um, very often uh, they're at points near the summits, very closely associated with these early JM monastic communities, um, as well as at Tripurankundram, they're located at the base. Um, so the JN, um, the early JN uh, uh, caves that are located at Tripurankundram are not at the base of the hill. So what's interesting here is that you know, you wouldn't have had to have engaged necessarily or gone up to visit uh, the Jain monastic area in order to visit um, this, this well or this water tank at the base. So this is really providing a service to sort of anyone um, sort of passing by and uh, uh, over the years had lots and lots of um, different kinds of pilgrims and visitors, right? We also have um, the large Murugan temple at the, at the base of this hill as well. Um, and then later um, the Muslim shrine at the top. Um, so this is also sort of communicating or signaling um, this association between this, this gift of water um, and the presence of, of these Jain monastics uh, at the site. And um, Julia Shaw has done some work on this with regard to Buddhist uh, monasteries and Buddhist water structures in, in Northern India. And so this is something I'm really interested in sort of looking at uh, more closely. Two questions in the chat. Where is the last image situated? This one? Yes. This one is at Alora. So this is not in this is not in Tamil Nadu. This is my this is my standard thank you ah. slide. Um, so yeah, this is an image of Mahavira from um, from the Jain caves at Alora. And another question related to that probably. Um, is it because of Ahinsa the artists for Jains switched to the painting caves at Elora? Which That's a, a wonderful you. question, but certainly um, the Jain caves at Alora have some very elaborate and detailed sculpture, sculptures. Um, so Lisa Owen has written on this, and these sculptures do indeed um, have complex undercuts. Um, and, and so you, you see both the paintings on the walls um, as well as the, um, the undercuts. And here you also have um, a lot of the really elaborate paintings are those in the Buddhist caves um, at Alora. Mm -hmm. uh, Jinesh uh, raised the hand. Are you still wanting to ask a question, Jinesh? Doesn't seem so. Um, well, the is a question a lot <laughs> you raised a lot of discussion here i don't think we have time to cover all of these questions um, um a question is whether there's hindu influence on okay the that's a question that um i i often get when i present on the jain images and the answer is that um, at least in the case of South India, uh, where I work, what we see is we see this emergen, uh, emergence of image worship really kind of happening um, across Buddhist, Hindu, um, and Jain uh, religious traditions with also the accompaniments as, as we start to see these new temples being built in stone, these are accompanied equally by these manuals. And some of these manuals, um, one of which I discuss uh, in the chapter, um, the Manasara has a section 
for Hindu temples, has a section for Buddhist temples, and has a section um, for Jain temples and how to carve um, Jain images as well. And so there's been some research on this, and the general sort of consensus that scholars are sort of going towards is that um, the people who are creating these images were not necessarily, probably were not um, necessarily one particular uh, religious identity or another, but rather the similarities that we're seeing is because of the complexity of these images, many of the same um, craftsmen who are crafting one uh, one at a Hindu temple and then later they go to you know a Jain monastic site and carve there. So it, the similarities is also because of an emerging aesthetic as well as the fact that it's likely that artisans worked at multiple kinds of sites which would have sort of led to this sort of overlapping. Um, maybe you can keep your answer short. There's a, okay. a long, very interesting comment from Anna uh, relating to the question whether, to what extent Jane Laity can harm one sense beings, uh, whether that's, this comes into play. And uh, it seems that uh, artisanal crafts are permissible occupations for laity. Um, based on the the... I mean, I would, I don't know, I would have to uh, be, be reading a, a, some more, but at least in terms of um, the medieval text that I was um, consulting, um, there are certain crafts that are forbidden. And even today, you know, in, in Gujarat, right, um, the people who do all of the um, work with, you know, the emerald gems and the other gems and the cutting, those are not Jains, right? That those roughing out of the of the um, of the gems and the gemstones and those kinds of like in metal smithing are traditionally not um, have been uh, crafts that have been um, mm. uh, done pursued by by Jains. But but perhaps Anna, you should message me and I can get um, corrected. Uh, so I, I would I would love to learn more about that. Well, there we have an interesting answer. Um, please have a look, Julie, at, at the long uh, Q&A list. You can maybe answer uh, directly later. May I suggest we have a shorter tea break? Just grab something and then uh, um, Ulle takes over to chair the, the final three hmm. presentation, right? Yeah. Ulle, are you... I'm, I'm You're policing the time now. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So should we say uh, like ten minutes break or something like that? Or sure, sure, okay, yeah, very good. Okay, so welcome to the third and last session of this workshop. Um, our next speaker is Brianne Donaldson, who currently serves as the Sri Parshvanath Presidential Chair in Jain Studies at the University of California, Irvine. Um, one of Brianna's her, uh, projects has been to examine principles of bio bioethics in the Jain tradition. And the result of this project, which have been conducted in collaboration with Anna Beitzel, will be published later this year at the University of California Press. Uh, so most welcome, Brianna, and we look forward to listening to your lecture. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks also, Peter, for bringing us together. Um, it's really good to have a chance to be with you all, even if it's virtual. Um, the Bhagavati Sutra describes five types of action, or kriya, or in Prakrit, kriya, that might be involved in a given act. And it's described here as uh, physical action, instrumental action, hostile action, tormenting action, and murderous action. A teaching lesson is provided to explicate these five aspects of action, which describes a hunter, his bow, and his arrow. If a man who takes a bow and shoots an arrow hits a living being, he is involved, putta, in the five actions, and so are the bodies of which his bow and arrow are made, meaning the wood of the bow, the bowstring, its tendon, the arrow, uh, meaning its shaft, the feather, the barb, and the string. If, however, the arrow hits the living being while falling back down, the man and the bow are involved only in the first four actions, whereas the arrow, the bodies of which it's made, and the beings that receive the falling arrow are involved in the five actions. 
So according to this story, if a hunter sets out to kill a living being, then he and all the living beings constituting his bow and arrow will be involved, putta, in the five actions. Right? This term putta, or Sanskrit sparsha, suggests having contact with, or in an alternate translation, being touched by the actions. This remarkable passage breaks down discrete elements within a given act. If the hunter didn't set out to harm a living being, he's not touched by the fifth consequence of murderous action. Yet, even if that particular intention is lacking, the hunter is still touched by the consequences of actions that are physical, instrumental, hostile, and tormenting. Further, the bodies that make up the bow and the arrow are involved in all five kriya, including murderous action even though, according to the Jaina's own account of life forms, these beings lack a mind. If we follow Suzuko Ohira's claim that the nucleus of the Bhagavati Sutra emerges in a, quote, age of theorization, end quote, between the earliest strata of the canon and then later more systematic texts, we can see that these Kriya uh, and this wider Kriya framework is an important hinge between earlier and later teachings, especially as pertaining to nonviolence and to karma. So Kriya is an interesting term that evolves several meanings in the earlier canon. For instance, um, we can see it um, as any deed or action as such. Um, it can also refer to self-generating activity of the soul or the jiv, which is a, a reclamation of the term kriya from the heretical view of the kriyavadins, that the soul was unchanging. Um, elsewhere, kriya is an evil deed associated with negative consequences of 18 harmful actions. And then also uh, another use, kriya, as a possible forerunner to positive karma. So why would the Bhagavati use the term kriya to identify distinctive aspects of harm, both physical and mental? I put for, uh, forth three possible reasons why the fivefold formula of kriya might have been suitable at that time. Uh, one is a growing mendicant community. The second is a development of a path of positive rebirth for lay people. And third is engaging with rivals. So I'm going to start with the first two reasons. Um, the early stages of the Acharanga Sutra and Sutrakatanga Sutra delineate the primary causation of harm as physical action or aramba. And then uh, and I saw this in Julie in your slides as well. Um, and then the secondary causation of harm as mental possessiveness or parigraha. Now this formulation was prior to the formal structure of five vows or even the regular use of the word ahinsa. That physical action was the primary cause of harm was reflected in the uncompromising physical restraints prescribed in the early texts in which monks were to meticulously avoid digging, bathing, lighting fires, walking, etc. This stringent emphasis on non-action seemingly presents no pathway of gradual progression for weaker mendicants who struggle with the physical restraints much less for householders who are still described in the Sutra Kathanga too as, uh, quote, killers of beings and acquirers of property. And we can see there that that's reflecting a kind of direct violation of aramba and then parigraha. One either restrains activity or one does not. There's no space for positive effort or intention. So in the overall chapter, I map the growth of the mendicant community in the early canonical period, uh, in part drawing from this uh, work that Peter mentioned, uh, in Insistent Life, where we're looking at uh, bioethics in the Jain tradition. Um, so I map the growth of the mendicant community in the early canonical period from solitary individuals to teachers and student groups, meaning that we have mendicants at different levels of discipline who can't perfectly practice non-action, and then we also have uh, possibly an increasing dependence on lay people that are needed to support that growing mendicant community. And those lay people, um, thus they need a pathway and an incentive to do action for the right purpose of meeting the needs of mendicants, uh, namely the possibility of positive rebirth, which was not previously theorized in the first canonical period. For the third reason, 
uh, the role of action and intent was an ongoing polemical debate with Buddhist rivals during this period. Uh, in the chapter, I find textual examples in which the Buddha locates moral responsibility in mental action rather than physical. And I include a few passages that directly challenge the contrary view that physical harms have a greater moral significance. And likewise, Jain texts directly engage Buddhist teachers. So Sutra Kathanga II records a, a kind of subtle version of this argument in which a Buddhist opponent claims that only living beings possessing mind can perform conscious harms that accrue karma. But the Jaina apologist rejects this, claiming that even single-sensed beings who lack mind are still karmically responsible for action due to their being unrestrained. Here we can see the passage, uh, the sentient beings and the senseless ones both are wrong in their conduct and commit sins through cruelty. So the Jaina response, um, we can see that the Jaina sages, they want to preserve an important role for physical action as causing harm. We could think of this um, as perhaps the ethical side and also maintain that all beings, even those without a mind, um, still participate in karmic responsibility. And we can think of that as the ontological side of the argument. But they're also recognizing the need to provide righteous paths for their own mendicant and lay community who cannot practice non-action fully. So I place the fivefold kriya in that context. So with that background, let's return to the list of the kriya in the Bhagavati Sutra. Although I focus primarily on set one in the chapter, I do want to point out that there is a second set of kriya in the Bhagavati that I'd like to consider with you as well. And, um, as I identify three roles that I think these sets of Kriya are serving. The first is Kriya as contact. So in set one, which I've outlined here in blue, we see action as foundationally physical. However, physical action may additionally be instrumental, hostile, tormenting, or murderous, depending on the actor's aim and or the proximity to the results or the consequences. The teaching lesson of the hunter arrow and bow makes clear that if the hunter intends to kill a living being, the hunter and all the constituent parts of the arrow and bow are responsible for all five kriya. However, if the arrow is shot into the air, the hunter is responsible for putting the first four actions into play, but not responsible for the last contact of murderous action. The constituent aspects of the bow and arrow, however, even though they lack the mind, uh, cannot escape karmic responsibility of this murderous contact. Even more remarkably, we now see in set two, outlined in green, that the first term of purposive harm is described with the Prakrit um, Arambya Kiriya. And this very term, Aramba, which described any physical action in the Acharanga Sutra, has now taken on a technical meaning and an internal quality of purposive action in the Bhagavati Sutra. Uh, Ohira argues that set one actually emphasizes the physical aspect of Kriya, likely formulated on the basis of Hinsa, which would later be can canonized in the five vows, while set two stresses the mental action of Kriya formulated on the basis of Parigraha, which would also be incorporated later in the vows. These sets of Kriya draw attention to the significant role of contact both in the sense of physical proximity as a critical component of harm, that is physically touching, but also uh, contact as an action's uh, karmic result, that is being touched by consequences related to a particular aspect of action. In these two sets of Kriya, both physical and mental actions can be touched by consequences. In the second role, Kriya describes action that follows a course. So in addition to being touched by consequences through both physical and mental action, Walter Schubring argues that any offense uh, follows a course. Uh, the very opening line of the Bhagavati uh, sheds light on this insight through the unique principle of the Chalamane Chalye, or what Ernst Luhmann calls the irrevocable factum tenet meaning that, quote, the action once set in motion equals the completed action, end quote. The Bhagavati explains the tenet this way. What one is about to get rid of equals gotten rid of. 
What one is about to cut equals cut. What one is about to break equals broken. What one is about to burn equals burned. What one is about to kill equals killed, and so on. Now, the appeal to intention here is hard to ignore insofar as the intent to break, for instance, is regarded as already broken. This tenet is likely unique to the Bhagavati's concern, not only because it's the opening line of the text, but because it doesn't seem to show up anywhere else. The tenet lacks any technical definition, and it relies primarily on narrative examples to explain it in different stories. In one story, when a monk sets out to meet an elder in order to confess a fault, he's regarded as loyal, even if some accident prevents him uh, from arriving, because quote, the action in progress equals the completed action. In our story of the hunter, arrow, and bow, we can see some indirect parallels with the Kriya that intending to kill equals killed, though the tenet is never formally applied to that particular narrative. In one other use, the irrevocable factum tenet illustrates the concern of heresy in the Bhagavati among students who contradict Mahavir's teachings. The disciple turned heretic Jamali, for instance, after falling ill, requests that a bed be made up for him, realizing um, that a bed being made is certainly not a bed fully made, resulting in his public disavowal of Mahavir's teachings. Uh, our own Peter Flugel offers a helpful synthesis of these two interpretations um, in German, I might add, so I really had to work for this translation. Uh, Flugel demonstrates how Jamali's perspective reflects a karmic understanding that's at odds with Mahavir's. In Jamali's view of the unmade bed, quote, an action is only considered to be completed when all sub-steps have been completed and the end result is achieved, meaning the bed is fully made. Correspondingly, the karmic effect of an action on the agent would only be felt after the entire process is completed, end quote. So this is counter to Mahavir, who locates karma accrual and at the observed initiation point of action, including any later sub-steps that might happen in different contexts or by different means. Kriya, when it viewed through the irrevocable factum tenet, seems to describe any actions put in motion by an initial karmically significant decision toward a goal that will lead to either an accumulation or a reduction of material karma. And finally, uh, kriya as hierarchical actions that are applicable to all beings. These two sets of fivefold kriya may function in the text to provide an alternate, more technical formulation of the concern articulated in the irrevocable factum tenet. Flugel describes these kriya as hierarchical actions, that is, actions that presuppose and logically imply other actions. Schubring describes the actions as bound in mutual relativity. If we just look at the set in blue, which was my primary focus, the teaching lesson suggests that a hunter shooting an, an arrow may imply all five aspects if the intention was to kill. A murderous action would certainly be physical, but a physical action need not necessarily be murderous. The hunter could have just been going for target shooting, so actions may differ according to their motivation. But how, there, how then is the bow and arrow responsible for all five kriya if the beings that constitute those objects lack a mind? And I think answers here seem speculative at best. Uh, Schubring acknowledges that the animation of weapons might serve two purposes. First, to reference the important distinction between beings that can do little to impact their karmic intake and humans who can do the most. And second, as a reminder that all humans may have previously existed as any kind of being, almost anticipation of the later theory of Nagods, or the smallest one sense beings that live and die in aggregate clusters, little able to impact their karma at all. Flugel suggests that the authors may have merely been trying to clarify Kriya as extending the scope of karma and responsibility in situation in which multi-causal factors come into play. But it strikes me that the responsibility of the arrow and the bow in this hierarchy, uh, hierarchy of actions retains, I think, three important Jaina features. First, 
against the Buddhist exclusion of non-human beings from karmic participation. The Jaina worldview posits the life force or jiv in all beings, enabling their participation in the karmic framework of cause and effect toward moksha. Second, even though intention is a growing factor in Jaina accounts of karmic harm, physical contact by the parts of the bow and arrow remain a significant karmic factor where beings are capable of touching others and being touched by the consequences. Third, harm can be caused in myriad ways, as expressed in the earliest affirmation of the Acharanga Sutra that I did it, I shall cause another to do it, I shall allow another to do it. That is, if the hunter sets in motion actions that result in the death of a living being, he may not personally bear the karma of murderous action, but he causes the beings that constitute the bow and arrow to accrue that karmic cost as instruments. Such a reading would add additional support to the important Jaina mandate to minimize possessions, not only because of one's attachments to those items, but because possessions can be used as instruments in actions that are not karmically neutral. Ultimately, the Bhagavati's fivefold kriya contributes to a more nuanced reading of Jaina nonviolence and karma theory. The kriya sets make clear that violence consists of many discrete acts, both mental and physical. Recognize that a course of events must be set in motion and that multiple living beings may be involuntarily deployed as instruments of harm in a given act, multiplying the karmic costs and also diversifying the karmic responsibility of a single action. The fivefold kriya preserve critical elements of Jaina philosophy, such as the karmic importance of action within a vibrant cosmology, while also evolving an account of nonviolence that moves beyond the personal practices of individual mendicants to a growing number of followers, including lay community members, who must also strive for harm reduction uh, within the wider community. Thanks. Thank you very much for a most interesting lecture. Um, I hope there are some questions or comments uh, among the participants. <laughs> Anyone, let's see the chat here. Um, I have a question. <clears throat> good, good. Thank you. Um, the uh, the example of the the arrow that falls down and injures a creature, and even the wood is make made responsible um, for the injury um, caused. How do you interpret that? Well, uh, Peter, why do you pick out the wood? Because when we look at it, right, it's like the arrow is made of the wood, it's uh, made of the bowstring, the tendon. So what is it about the wood that Oh, seems... not uh, for instance, that just struck. Oh, just any of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to say, I hardly know what to make out of any of it. That's why I really wanted to look at this passage, because I'm always interested in this way that um, these, the it's such a unique within global philosophy, the way that the Jaina thinkers just refuse to give up on some kind of non-human agency. And even to the, and it's so different, I think, than when we think about kind of contemporary perspectives of that, uh, you know, that's, that many beings either are either mechanistic or that they live by instinct or that they have, uh, you know, we can't hold them responsible. Uh, that the Jain view just never accepts this. Um, and so I think it's just, you know, I guess really thinking through this sense that of a physicality, that um, especially in the concept of contact, that the actual parts of the uh, kind of the, the matter, the jiva jiva combo, when it touches something, this putta, that there's something about that physical materiality of the contact that means that uh, beings can't be off the hook, even if it's wood or the, the feather or, or whatever is the bow part. And my, my argument, just as a footnote, was also that this is uh, um, 
to get demonstrate more uh, provide more clarity about different elements that are relevant in describing an action your know, intention the condition the consequence etc so not just the hierarchical um, conditionality but uh, you know, different aspects of an action mm -hmm. of which uh, with the relative with relation to Jamali um, that example I was of the opinion that Mahavira looks at the completed action and uh, Jamali looks at the intended action action as a as something projected into the future and uh, whereas for um, Mahavira only what has been done um, counts and whatever has been done has been done and is of course karmically you know accounted automatically qua the mechanism anyway mm. thank, <laughs> thank you. you very much it's fab fabulous mm. okay thank you very much and then our there was a question i think yeah. uh, oh, okay was a question where maybe que someone uh, raised a hand ah see here no i don't see any hand I'm sorry, then I missed it. It's all right. Thank you all. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Samani Pratibha Pragnya from the Jain World Peace Center. And uh, she will talk about Ahimsa Prashikshana, a social religious initiative. Thank you to organizers. Ahimsa Prashikshan, a social religious initiative. The generic term prescription refers to educating someone in a particular subject or training, equipping with a certain skill. It is common term that applies to all sorts of learning when prescription is associated with a religious, ethical, or social agenda, such as ahimsa. It adopts a specific meaning. Acharya Mahapragya, a prominent Jain Acharya, initiated Ahinsa Prasikshan in 1991 to promote and widen the scope of non-violence and interfaith harmony. Ahinsa is most prominent and well-known phenomena in Jainism. The Ahinsa Prasikshan is a socio-religious initiative uh, which has a fourfold strategy. Um, a theory and history of nonviolence, paddhati and itihas, transformation of heart, riday parivartan, attitudinal change, drishtikon parivartan, change in lifestyle, jivan shali parivartan. It is argued that ahinsa prashikshan is a modernized outlook of the cardinal principle of ahimsa, though the process of secularization broadening the scope of application of ahimsa is incorporation with various elements, Mahapragya has attempted to transform the self and society. This paper explored the innovative ways in which the guru can transform the ideology and conduct of the masses without religious conversion or a change in religious and cultural identity through the use of intermediate goals related to social and moral well-being. I term this sort of mass engagement of the guru as engaged spirituality. Scientific analysis of Jain Siddhant and practices in process of redefining various concepts in the light of science is a way towards modernity. Mahapragya's deliberate adoption of modern scientific approach in significant aspect of science, psychology, and liberal approach towards secular presentation of ahimsa is an expression of Jain modernism for which the key feature is 
uh, as uh, defined by Peter Flugel, belief in the superiority of the present over the past. In this study, we gain an understanding how seemingly old fixed concepts are not in reality, but they are still considered and reformulated for the current need of people. In the history of Ahinsa, in the context of Mahavira and his teaching, Jainism has formed a full system of restraint and rules, which are the way ways of observing ahimsa at external level, extreme level for the ascetic with the um, five great vows, samiti and guptis. The life of Jain Leti is also framed by the complex set of 12 vows, bare breath, made to encourage ahimsa, which is addressed to all possible area of a householder life and such as profession, food, behavior, and their travel, limitation of acquisition and possession. So through these all 12 vows, we can see there is a boundary of Brata. We gain an understanding of how these uh, rules which are fixed, but they still represented in a modern way. He, Mahapragya had used various branches of knowledge and shaped in the modern context. First of all, causing of the violence are very important. Without the understanding of the causes, uh, one cannot uh, come out from this problem. So he has taken greed, fear, hostility, anger, egoism, intolerance, and absolutistic way and absolute behavior. And all these are very much important uh, for uh, understanding the causes of violence. When the change in this perspective, then the overcoming of the violent feeling and instinct will be possible. Merely studying the theory and history, one cannot achieve change into attitude, beliefs, and lifestyle. The second dimension of the training of nonviolence is change of heart. Here, the term heart is very important. Uh, the word heart does not mean physiological heart, or but it is, has different meaning here. Here it means emotion or feeling. The Ayurveda text, Vashishta Yoga, chapter 8, upholds that there are two hearts, one beside the lungs and the other in the brain. The genesis of emotion is in the limbic system, a part of the brain. According to Acharya Mahapragya, Change in heart means replacing the negative emotion into positive one. Attachment, hatred, jealousy, disgust, etc. are all negative feeling, while friendliness, compassion, mercy, love, affection are the positive emotions. The process of transformation of such emotion is known as change of the heart. It requires the change through the process trend to the one's mindset with different practices. That is abhyas. And Mahapriti also talk about the economic health and non-violence. Training is uh, very important. So voluntary parting the wealth and that is known acquisition. Decentralization of the economy, economic uh, health is very important for the non-violence. Legitimate means of making money, just distribution of the wealth. As we seen, that small part of wealth is distributed. Then many uh, projects can be carried out. Uh, restraint in com commercialism 
and limitation of want is also important for the economic health of the world. And same time, Mahaprag never ignored the physical body. The somatic health is also important for the non-violence training. Here, the intrinsic relation between physical health and non-violence. If the impaired health is there, it generates violence. One of the factors is responsible for the suicide. Many case studies reveal that there is the inadequate level of sugar in the blood. That Atipa, Atipa. Yes. Your slides do not move forward. We can't oh. see them. Okay. So I, I think let me finish first this. Okay. Yeah. So the disorder in spleen and liver also contribute to the violent thought. Therefore, training in different aspect of health science is important for the practice of non-violent non-violence. Acharya Mahaprake employed the tool of preksha meditation for the transformation of habit and behavior. During the preksha dhyan practice, uh, practitioners are always encouraged to visualize white color at the center of forehead, the center of enlightenment. This center is correlating with the pituitary gland, which is known as master gland. It suggests that one imagine rising moon at the center of forehead uh, or any white color, which is associated with uh, the lesha, uh, pure lesha, shukla lesha. According to Acharya Mahaprage, leshas are micro vibration or the karmic color that act as a legend between spiritual self and physical self of the living organism. Though the perception of specific color, one is able to transform benevolent lesha into malevolent lesha into benevolent lesha and resulting into the total eradication of cruelty, hatred, etc. On the same time, this is the perception-based practices. And on the other hand, Mahaprage involved the psychology, the contemplative experience of the central tool in the realm of somatic psychology. Anupreksha practices can actually help us to rewire the brain towards new habits and new habits formation is possible through the neuroendocrinology. For a person experiencing heightened anger, fear, anxiety, and direct attention um, might choose to focus on the feeling of one's grounding into the earth rather than direct sensation of anger, fear, anxiety. This practice allows people to reorient their attention towards balance, also enabling them to create a space between their impulses and their response. Mahaprage addresses using these uh, small activities in the sitting into group, group meditation, group pranayam, group exercise. He notes that there are certain activities, harmonized group of people. He maintained that healing is a communal endeavor and that is settled body initiative others and settle others as well, means influencing each other's vibration. Some of these harmonizing activity include like humming sound, mahapran dhvani, breathing uh, long, deep and rhythmic, swas preksha, and together with these practices, pranayam, and also rubbing the somatic parts, uh, or rocking and rolling, all these are similar practices. And I think they uh, are the practice which are more secular than religious. 
So here, these practices are very, very common and helping to the masses. This paper has revealed that some open boundaries of Mahinsa were not discussed in traditional package of five Mahavratas, 12 Sravakvratas, and higher religious pr practices like Pratimas. Still, these packages are ongoing uh, in the Jain practices. Interestingly, the customary terms such as current yoga are not used in the new terminology of Ahinsa Prashikshan. Though the process of secularization broadening the scope of application of Ahinsa by incorporating various elements uh, from science and psychology uh, is made a modernistic approach of Mahapragya. Ahinsa Prashikshan is uh, a fourfold system of training and encourages and develops the non violent principles uh, both through heart and mind and extremely through one's conduct. The first two limbs of this system are change of heart and change of attitude. Mahapragya told that practice of Anupreksha as a means of replacing negative thoughts and emotion impulses with positive instead. These inner foundation work uh, in the inner cultivation of restraint and the uh, third limb and the fourth limb change in lifestyle, which means discerning between wants and need reducing one's want and reducing uh, and legitimating, one, limiting one's luxuries. This is the reinforcement of the last limb, a change of livelihood, which requires that jobs involving excess violence like uh, industrialization and globalization should be avoided. Thus, Mahapragya attempted to ensure that development uh, of a training encompasses both inner mental and emotional aspect and external behavior and action, uh, which is very important and the function of individual, family unit, society, local, national, and global. I quote from um, Prasna Vyakran Sutra, there is an interesting veneration of Ahinsa, Sabba Bhuya Khemankari Ahinsa. So here we can see Ahinsa Prashikshan is a pragmatic and concerned with worldly need, while Ahinsa is transcendent and addressing the big question of existence. And the Prasna Vyakran Sutra. Um, the known violence is bestower of well-being to all living being. And here the use of a bhut as in Jain terminology, prana, bhuta, sattva, all are bhut. But I, I would like to see in a different light, bhut is also materialism also. So um, uh, th where there is a limitation of the materiality, that is also leading towards the peace and non-violence. So I finish here, but I would like to discuss my slide a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> Mahapragya presented the full course and the possibility of the cultivation of Ahinsa is very, very uh, visible in his lessons and module of Ahinsa prescription. Interestingly, in 1991, University, Jainvi Shabharti University introduced a Department of Peace Research and Nonviolence, and the courses are offered BA, MA, MPhil, PhD. Uh, PG diploma and certificate course and so on. And also, um, yeah, the training center 
for the known violence. So vocational training centers were started throughout India and I have a study of uh, really from 2001 to 2017. So more than 18 states of India have these centers. So the, the graph shows that highest uh, centers of peace and non-violence in Rajasthan, 158, and then Jharkhand, 66, and Bihar, 31, but altogether 16 states of it. And also, on the um, assignment of uh, Ahinsa and non-violence, there are seven, uh, 12 international conferences, uh, also organized by Anubibha, which is a body. And finally, the Ahinsa Yatra carried out by Mahaprage and also Acharya Mahashraman. So uh, connecting India, Nepal, Bhutan, so more than 50,000 kilometers Ahinsa Yatra by the leader of uh, Therapad sect was organized and carried out. So Ahinsa Prashikshan at grassroots for the school level also, and then training in Ahinsa at, um, at the training centers is available in India. So this uh, module is presented and uh, training centers are opened and many uh, centers open the heart for the employment because hunger and unemployment is the biggest cause under the violence and Mahaprag has seen it and try to solve this problem through Ahinsa prescription. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting and visionary and inspiring lecture. Huh? Um, I think we may have, maybe we can take one question, but then I think we have to to go on um, with uh, Peter's uh, final lecture here. Is there any question, any comment? Uh, I have a question, yeah. Samniji. Uh, I just wondered this, the point that you made about healing as a community endeavor, I wondered if there were any, um, if Mahaprajna draws that theme from any textual point or if that's his own development, the, the concept of healing as a community endeavor? It is, uh, first of all, it is Mahaprag's own uh, experience and uh, normally the behavior when the abnormality occurs might be ill health or any scarcity. So these are common reason. So looking at the common life I think he has taken into account for this Ahinsa prescription. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much once again. Uh, Peter, are you there? Um, yes. You are there, okay. So our last speaker now is, of course, our dear friend and great colleague, etc., etc., Peter Fliegel. And uh, you, Peter, you're going to talk about, you have a very critical title, The Nonviolence of Nonviolence. So you have to, I think, explain that in your lecture now. So please. Um, what is critical about that? No, cr cryptic. Oh, cryptic. Okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> Maybe not. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> um, Is, is the site visible? Yes, yes, very good. Okay. Um, right, uh, references and so on. Um, read a bit and then I, I move on to slides to uh, save time. Um, the, he who knows the violence done for the sake of special objects knows what is free from violence. He who knows what is free from violence knows the violence done for special objects. This is uh, one of the oldest verses in the Shvetambara scriptures in the Ayaranga. 
and it shows obviously that violence and nonviolence are uh, intrinsically connected in the theorizing of uh, the Jains. The apparent paradox recognized in this and other canonical passages that cognition of violence is a condition and hence integral part of a religious system aimed at the maximization of nonviolence can be explained with the help of the theory of autopoetic or living systems of Nicholas Luhmann as a consequence of the fact that all social systems constitute themselves through selective self-referential mechanisms based on binary codes, programs, and routines, which constitutes the elements that function as its parts. The paper presents a theoretical interpretation of the Jaina tradition, arguing that as a social system, the Jaina tradition reproduces itself with reference to a combination of an asymmetrical ontological code, jiva ajiva, and an asymmetrical moral code, ahimsa himsa implemented through programs, that is, criteria for the allocation of objects and processes to one or to the other side of the constitutive asymmetrical distinctions. Jaina philosophy itself highlights the significance of binary categorizations. The method of binary classification is not just a tool of modern structuralisms, but a principle used in Jaina epistemology. The canonical Aniyoga Dvara discusses various forms of categorization using the term do nama to name as a designation for any binary distinctions informing the method of taxonomic classification, such as monosyllabic versus multisyllabic, jiva versus ajiva, vishesha versus avishesha, meaning genus and species. Though the distinction between violence and non-violence or injury and non-injury, harm and harmlessness, or rather the positive value of non-violence alone, is nowadays taken for granted in Jain culture, its dominance as a root metaphor is the outcome of a long history of scholastic systematization, as Klaus Brun has shown. Only with the consolidation of the Ahimsa reductionism predicated on the mushrooming of synonyms, of uh, synonymous ahimsa words and himsa words, described also by Colette Kaya, and the crystallization of a central binary code in medieval times, the Jaina tradition was able to develop a stable semantic system, as well as autopoetic social systems predicated on such religious semantics because all systems are predicated on reductions of complexity. Here you can see that this often cited verse from the Dashavai uh, Kalika uh, refers to Dharma rather than Ahimsa, which of course plays a role there, just as an example. By reinterpreting the insights of Brun in terms of Luhmann's theory of social systems, the paper argues that the crystallization of a central moral code through processes of semantic duplication and self-referential reduction was the condition for the development and integration of networks of relations between supplementary codes and programs which stabilized the Jain system over time. Because the late emergence of a central code, the, sense, uh, the Jain religion must be considered as a relatively recent development, um, as a self-referential uh, social system, as evident in the absence of generalizing self-designations, such as Saint Jaina Sangha. Uh, such terms are fairly recent. The proposition that the Jaina tradition, like all established semantic systems, consolidated itself through the reduction of initial terminological complexity to dominant asymmetrical codes, such as ahimsa ahimsa, is both simple and complex. All philosophers will agree that avoiding pain is desirable. Suyagada 2279 demonstrates by way of a narrative thought experiment, though they evidently do not anonymously agree on the status of ahimsa 
as the one supreme philosophical principle as proposed by the Jaina philosophers. Here, um, someone asked the assembly of all philosophers who believe in different things to take into the hands a vessel full of holes and hold them from it. All philosophers refused to do that. And then uh, they were challenged. Why uh, are they not doing this? Because uh, it's painful, of course. Because you're afraid of pain, you hold back your soul creatures averse. Uh, are all creatures are averse to pain. This is the implication. And then it is said, this is a maxim of general application. It is a true principle, a religious reflection. This maxim principle religious reflection holds good with regard to every living being. The word ahimsa is not mentioned there at all, uh, just the avoidance of pain. At the heart of the matter is the philosophical question of the ontological status and the function of the distinction itself that separates the semantic realms of nonviolence and violence. Which distinction, positive and negative? And with the help of additional criteria, unstable collection, should enable observers to sort all phenomena in two distinct sets, sets. In set theory, you should remain. The problem is that in practice, not all phenomena can be sorted into either one or the other set, but may be classified as both and or neither nor. This is recognized in the tetralemmas of Buddhist and Jaina logic, the Chatushkoti and Chaturbangi. Additionally, the attribute indescribable, avyaktavya, is used, thus rendering lists of more than four irreducible alternatives, such as the Jaina Saptabangi classification. De facto, the classification of intermediary categories between is and is not recognizes the practical difficulties implied by uh, the distinction itself in, in practical context. I do not believe evidently that Jaina logic is ultimately concerned with problems of logic per se, but with practical problems. In contrast to Jaina philosophy, the idealist second century Buddhist philosopher Nagarjuna taught in his Madhyamaka Karika that all factors of being, dharma and all mental cognitions, judgments, Vijnana and linguistic distinctions, Vikalpa, that is, dependent designations, Prajnapti Upadaya, that are responsible for the identification of distinct phenomena, Prapancha, in mind and language, are empty, Shunyata. Sri Harsha, the distinguished 13th century Advaiti, a hidden Buddhist, believed at least consciousness to be real, if not the world, uh, if not the world, as the Nyaya Vasheshika and Jaina philosophers presupposed, which his critique of the philosophical method of distinction targeted with uh, uh, in, in, uh, explicitly following Nagarjuna. Sri Harsha argued that while all philosophical systems are rooted in fundamental distinctions and networks of relations, every distinction carries the seed of its solution within itself. For this reason alone, all phenomena of this world, whether empirical objects or objects of thought, are ultimately inexplicable. A nirvachanya, chanya. By the method of distinction, of dis discriminative insight, as the Jains would say, only consciousness that is ultimately Brahma is real. In an intriguing, timeless analysis based on first principles, he demonstrated that all acts of distinction are ultimately self-defeating and and either in paradox or in an infinite um, regress. And uh, here I, I, I cite a, a summary of Das Gupta. The concept of difference can hardly be defined, uh, Harsha, Sri Harsha said. If it lies involved within the essential nature of all things that differ, then difference would be identical with the nature of the things that differ. If difference were different from the things that differ, then it would be necessary to find out some way of establishing a relation between difference and the things that differ. And this might require another connection and that another, and so we should have a vicious, endless series. 
Um, this difference may be looked from different perspectives. I mean, this is from Nagarjuna on, uh, on difference. I skipped this. So here are the perspectives. As the nature of things are understood or perceived, um, this dif difference as part of the nature of things as understood or perceived. This implies uh, that uh, uh, all other things are uh, implicitly related to as different um, without consideration, uh, without apprehension, apprehension of um, their distinctive nature. If the distinction is too extraneous to things, then an infinite regress uh, emerges as just uh, described. That the distinction between the di distinction and the, the, the object um, uh, requires another distinction to be explained and so on. Another form of distinction uh, mentioned by Sri Harsha is the mental negation of other things. So um, the, uh, the book is not the table. This uh, then leads to the problem of class attributes, imaginary objects, etc. The unicorn, you know, I'm not a unicorn, something like this. Um, finally, opposition, Vaidharmya, that also uh, involves an infinite regress. This is what we are, of course, mainly interested in. If difference is regarded as the possession of opposite characters, Vaidharmya, then also it may be asked whether the opposite characters have further opposite characters to distinguish them from one another. And these again others, and so there's a vicious infinite. Again, it may be asked whether these distinguishing characters are themselves different from the objects which possess them or not. If they are different, one may again ask concerning the opposition, opposing characters which lead to this difference. And then again about other opposing characters of these and so on. So uh, the very interesting observation here, uh, in, infinite differences require infinite time, but objects are finite and limited in time that creates problems. And we could discuss endlessly about uh, Siad Vada and so on. If differences come in all at once and not one after the other in time, there would be disorder and no clear a determination, uh, conceptual de determination possible, except for hypothetical omniscient. Um, it can therefore be said that our perception of differences has any such, uh, has no such um, uh, intrinsic validity that it can contradict the ultimate unity in the Upanishadic text. Well, that is his view. Very interesting indeed. In European scholasticism also, different types of distinction were uh, differentiated, conceptual, real, and uh, the distinction between conceptual and real itself. Uh, so much as an introduction. Now, uh, the distinction of um, involved in cultural codes, and I have argued that uh, Ahimsa, Ahimsa is a cultural code which constitutes the a Jaina system and is ultimately self-defeating uh, on logical grounds, whatever one thinks about the practice. Um, of course, in the history of, uh, let us say, Indian socio sociology of India and Indology, this is an old hat. You know, uh, Louis de Maure has argued that Hinduism is uh, basically um, structured by uh, binary code, pure and impure. And Padmanabh Jaini has argued the same for Jainism, just that Jainism defines it differently. So I, instead of pure and impure, which may equally work, uh, I put violence and nonviolence up. Um, but I, I have a, a slightly different sociological theory in mind to, to say that in, in the beginning, I pursue that. Uh, Dumont has a, a neo-Kantian uh, um, value manifestation uh, theory, you know, levels of value, when you have a, a dominant value and then um, uh, less and lesser value. So purity would be the dominant value. Whereas I follow Luhmann and say the distinction, so the empty space between the two can never be 
um, uh, 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 transcended by a single positive value. You always have the opposition in any of these religious systems. So uh, the distinction itself is contingent. There's a certain arbitrary uh, to it, which is absolutely unavoidable and just a feature of of uh, uh, semantic systems. Coding systems are constituted by the re-entry of a distinction in the unmarked space between that which is distinguished, generating a state of systemic, system-specific indeterminacy. That is the oscillation between positively and negatively evaluated operations and between self-reference and heterofference. That means the system can only be uh, constituted if it becomes self-referential. Um, in, in my case, it is if, if nonviolence is related to nonviolence, or um, the, the, the distinction between nonviolence and violence is related to itself. Um, here is what Padmanabh Jaini said, anything that was not shudha was considered to be uh, ashudha, activities which were not productive of salvation. Now, this is, of course, part of it. Jaina philosophy. Um, the concept of Ashuda is needed to um, make clear what is Shuddha. So it is an absolute essential component. It's not outside the conceptual system. It will negate it completely. You know, we're not interested in this at all. We're only interested in Shuddha. Um, that's not how it works. That would not be uh, forming a stable uh, semantic system. Now, <laughs> a little bit of social cybernetics. A semantic systems, let us say, a code is a model to, uh, uh, which relates to information, uh, pulls up information, um, distinguishes um, actions that are violent and non-violent, you know, according to its binary code, and uh, with these distinctions uh, regulates an action. This is only if the model is practically used, if it's ignored, it has absolutely no relevance whatsoever. But this is, if a system works, then it works like this. Um, and it's basically an informational system, which may have uh, um, repercussions for uh, systems of actions. That means communications that uh, produce communications and produce communications until they stop and then the system is finished. Um, religious systems as living systems, these are autopoetic systems, not as some static social structure or, you know, fourfold community or something, but as living systems which need uh, constant rep reproduction through uh, actions that connect with other actions. And here the theory of Luhmann comes in. All social systems, including religious systems, constitute themselves through selective self-referential mechanisms based on binary codes, programs, and routines, which constitute the elements of a system that function as it parts. Human beings are not part of social systems or religious systems. It's their actions or other attributes uh, or processes in which they're involved, which become part of systems. This is something counterintuitive, but in systems theory, this is what it, how it works. And this produces a non-essentialist approach to uh, social, um, let us say, uh, sociology of religion in our field, um, which gets away with, with a lot of problems uh, of, uh, you know, I don't need to go into that. As a social system, the Jain tradition reproduces itself as a rep uh, combination of ontological and moral code, etc. I said this already, this is my argument. To make this clear, um, this is the logic of uh, Spencer Brown, which uh, uh, Luhmann has popularized, a uh, British mathematician. Uh, Laws of Form is his book. And he pointed out that every distinction basically involves a combination of distinction and indication. That means uh, there is a marked state, a state that is indicated as pointed to, and an unmarked state which is the outside, as it were. And, uh, um, well, let me leave that for another day. Um, 
the crux of the whole matter is that systems uh, of uh, distinctions can only be produced by re-entry of the distinction in the unmarked space that is the distinction itself, or is marked by the distinction itself, which is drawn by an observer, of course. Um, uh, this always implies two types of reference. One, this is Spencer Brown, an explicit one, the value of the marked side, and an implicit one, the, uh, the outside observer, which is not named. Um, the outside is the side from which a distinction is supposed to be seen. So you have, it looks like this, if you apply it to a distinction between violence and nonviolence, uh, or the other way around. Um, the outside observer, that is you and me, I suppose, um, is implicit. Without it, nothing could be uh, seen. And this is associated with social systems theory, you know, system and environment, of course, the chains turn this round. So uh, the re-entry of the distinction into the space of the distinction itself can be um, as an article of uh, Phyllis Grant, uh, of Paul Dundas <laughs> uh, had in the title, can produce uh, the non-violence of violence relationship. So uh, the question is always uh, how to designate this, characterize the distinction itself. We know what the two distinguished elements are, but what is the distinction? It could be anything. Uh, the entire world is implied here. So if you then um, apply the distinction to itself, self-referentially, then you have the non-violence of violence as part of the system differentiated from the outside of the system. You could write uh, violence here again, if you like. And this is how a system is, is constituted. That means the outside has been uh, incorporated into the inside of the system and violence in this case becomes part of the system and not something that is outside it. And this is uh, the scandal, the logical scandal in Jaina art, uh, architecture, literature, and philosophy. Violence is constitutive for the Jain system, which of course values nonviolence higher, higher than violence. You can also have the violence of nonviolence. This is an article of Phyllis Granoff, and she has this in the title. So just the sequence has been changed here. And this is sort of the standard uh, um, version. But you can also have the nonviolence of nonviolence. And this is my, uh, <laughs> my take on the thing. You know, if you want to have a purely self-referential nonviolence, that would be the perfect uh, Jane system, um, uh, of course. But uh, I, uh, violence is always presupposed. That is quite clear. Otherwise, you don't cannot have the non. And here, Klaus Brun comes in. He shows how the Ahimsa reductionism uh, produced um, uh, a mushroom rooming of synonyms. Or is, uh, is predicated on a mushrooming of synonyms of ahimsa and himsa words. Uh, he and Kaya have uh, uh, traced this in the literature, and you you can see that ahimsa becomes self-referential. You know, if you say this term is synonymous with that term, and so on, and then you uh, generate a system of terms that are related to each other, and the same with uh, ahimsa words, and. Uh, these words, uh, these uh, sequences, however, of synonyms do not form a system <laughs> unless they become self-referential as a whole. And so this is uh, um, a stable system. This uh, happens if a, a central binary uh, code is, can uh, be crystallized, and this has a case in uh, medieval times uh, only. And I refer to the work of Brun and so on. So there's an ahimsa reductionism and the karma reductionism, which Brun has uh, uh, traced. So uh, ahimsa reductionism is if ahimsa is um, declared to be the sum of vows 
the vow of Ahimsa is declared to be the sum of the vows X, Y, Z, etc. And uh, uh, the quint is declared to be the quint essence of Jaina doctrine, to quote. Uh, Madame Kaya, she of course quotes a very early text where this term uh, appears, although not Ahimsa as such. So uh, that would be uh, maybe more a case of pan ahimsism, the term which Brun introduced, that everything, all the prescriptions in the Jaina text are interpreted as manifestations of ahimsa. So satya, steya, brahmachari, aparigraha, these um, Patanjali terms, you know, all are just, you know, basically the same as ahimsa. Um, so uh, if you apply this to ethics and so on, uh, you can see uh, how a one level, uh, let me call it proto system, is turned into a system if several levels through self references are internally uh, generated. So um, between, I'm referring here to the title of John Cord's book, there are similarly uh, Mahiyas. Um, convivialité et délivrance. So this is uh, liberation and well-being are opposed as values. And then uh, well-being can be incorporated into the um, Jaina system if within the system of Jain values, say the rebirth in heaven becomes a, um, an aim in itself, although it is distinguished from liberation. So this shows how through self-reference, through re-entry of the distinction in the distinguished the systems um, develop. And these are dynamic processes according to social theory, which I cannot get, get into here uh, closely. I don't read this. It's clear that a large vocabulary was useful to mark communal differences um, and uh, then to develop these self-referential mechanisms, which Bruin did not analyze. Uh, but um, he didn't want to take that step because he was distrustful of binary, of reductive language, although all the building blocks were there. But he gives examples like these, um, how um, one term is ex explained with reference to two others. And this is, of course, a conceptual uh, self-reference or development uh, systems building, if you like, and semantics. Uh, this, uh, I would argue, uh, is um, an elaboration of Hempel and Oppenheimer's uh, work in, uh, in logic. Uh, terminological dynamism in dogmatic systems and all this, uh, I move on rather quickly. The Jaina path of salvation. So uh, Moksha Marga, this is um, what uh, um, the main distinction ultimately has to explain. Your himsa, ahimsa, how can that this contradiction be resolved? Uh, it, it is resolved by Moksha Marga and through further distinctions, this become, it can become uh, clearer. So you can see how uh, through this uh, logic, law of form type of logic, the problems which uh, Brun and others in uh, Indology have addressed uh, can be uh, um, revisited. Um, there are two systemic roles of Ahimsa as an all encompassing of Himsa as an environment of the Jain system and as a constitutive part of the Jain system. And this is what I'm interested in. Uh, compare also jiva, ajiva, dedekyan, discriminative insight, all these issues, they face the same paradoxes basically of distinction. Um, I think I have said enough, like Satan and God in Christianity, Himsa and Himsa are mutually constitutive as non-religion and religion is. If any of the opposites would be eliminated, the other would lose its meaning. Um, so, is <laughs> I think I'm, I'm talking already too much. So the uh, the question of oscillation between value spheres, which you find in some uh, field studies, 
which uh, perplexed uh, uh, people, uh, you know, um, is uh, Jains, Jain lay people oscillating between Hinduism and Jainism, they have different gods at home, um, are they pursuing well-being, you know, in business and liberation at the same time, they're torn in two directions, um, and the term oscillation is often uh, mentioned, and also, of course, the ambiguities in terminology, designating both of the two um, uh, distinguished um, elements uh, to fix this. Of course, you can't fix it. It leads to an infinite regress. Um, we know that. And this is a, a value realization um, type of theory. And, uh, but in the theory of um, living systems, uh, it is quite clear that coding regulates the oscillation between the positive and negative value. That is the contingency of evaluations. That means for a person, there's always the question, how to sort an, an event? You know, is it violent or is it nonviolent? This is what the system demands you to do. You have to take a decision. But which side you ultimately um, commit to, you know, is eating... Is drinking milk violence or non-violence? Um, you're familiar with these debates, but it's system determined. It is not, it's nothing else. This is the interpretation I'm offering. So uh, the uh, oscillation is typical for all distinctions. The, what is distinguished, um, if something is distinguished, you can um, you have to consider both elements are distinguished and the distinction which creates this indeterminacy and uh, allows for choice is the positive aspect. Um, if there would be only one value, you know, be nonviolent, then there would be no choice um, and uh, no, no system really. So, uh, um, Ultimately, social systems, including religious systems, can therefore be made understood to be always selections, uh, processes that are selective in time. They're not fixed entities, um, but uh, dynamic relationships which can never be understood by looking at them statically. Okay, I uh, close here. Thank you very much, Peter. It's um... I'm sure I have some comments and 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 the questions, but I have I think I have to listen to the lecture once more. So there's so many things that came up to my mind, came up to mind when I listened to this interesting lecture. Uh, so um, there is one um, question from Roy Russell here: Can a person inhabit more than one value system at the same time? Of course, sure. That is an old sociological hat. Um, I thought that may come up. Yeah. And I show it to you. Oops, this is something else. Anyway, I, I, I tell you, it's uh, in the, you can't see the slides which I just showed. Um, that, that is, uh, anything can be related to more than one system. That's the whole point of it. I mean, uh, what we are saying, us sitting here discussing something, it can have a scholarly aspect, it can have psychological aspect, this and that, different for each individual. So whatever there is can be related to different systems. It has no intrinsic value, but is significance determined in context. And we, we all are in multiple contexts at any point in time. And the same with Jainism, uh, it's only one aspect of, uh, say, human uh, beings who are um, entertaining this system or are related to it in one way or another by others, maybe even. The answer is yes, of course. And I refer to Max Weber and people like that who have already laid all this bare. There's one, qu one uh, question from uh, Jay Sony. Would it be helpful to justify Ahimsa metaphysically through the concept of Asrava, where the ideal of Shuddha, Shubha also comes in? Uh, 
Um, Maybe on request, I, I tried to switch off the back thing. But, mm -hmm. So, uh, um, where is mm -hmm. Jay? Would it helpful to say Ahimsa metaphysically? So, <coughs> um, Shuddha Shuba comes also. I mean, these are supplementary uh, um, distinctions. Of course, there's not a single distinction, but this is just as the argument, this has developed historically into the dominant distinction to which whole networks of other distinctions are linked in specific ways. Yeah. And uh, the image I showed uh, at the end, which uh, maybe I can show once more, this is a reconstruction of uh, how one can uh, look at, say, the social uh, historical development as a a uh, differentiation of initial distinctions. Forgive me the German here. It's external, internal. So <laughs> within each category, further distinctions are uh, inserted um, in a historical sequence. It's not pre, uh, pre-designed. And in retrospect, one can maybe constitute it like this. Maybe there are other ways of representing it, but I just wanted to uh, explain the principle of differentiation of differences. I think we could close with, uh, there is a question from Brianne Donaldson, and that would be the last question then. Huh? So please, Brianne. Yes. Yeah. Uh, great, thank you, Peter. Uh, your, your visage is also quite cryptic, uh, as <laughs> because we just see some floating eyes. Um, you know, I actually really love this, um, because I, I feel like this is actually where a lot of my work is, is trying to think about um, juxtaposed ideals. And um, I'm actually right now writing a grant for a John Templeton Foundation to do a, a conference on Jainism. Uh, we're inviting people to look at dynamic dualisms. So... Um, this is right there. Um, also, my, my first book, Creaturely Cosmologies, looked at, um, I used the mathematician Alfred North Whitehead to think about uh, ac the, the process of unification of, of poles. So I guess um, I wanted to ask you if I've been you know, thinking that activity uh, or ahimsa or ethics is, is kind of the, the fusion of these dipolarity so like the real and the ideal and that activity is the sort of the coordination of these um, you're using different terminology because you're coming from sociology and systems and i think i'm thinking more uh, metaphysical theory but i wondered if you could say something about this asymmetry that you're talking about what what is the asymmetrical part of the binaries as you're seeing them well, these are evaluations that are put on top and also perspectives. You know, these are, if, you, if you draw a distinction, you have, um, I mean, if you want to know what is, is nonviolence, you have to distinguish it from, from something. And so that you put the priority of nonviolence. It's completely um, arbitrary in the end, but usually some one, one of the two, relata, is evaluated positive and the other negative. So two distinctions are um, superimposed. Mm -hmm. A completely symmetrical distinction makes no practical sense. That is, of course, the, um, the underlying issue. Well, just one follow-up then. Um, why would you call it totally, um, you said, you just used the phrase um, completely arbitrary. Because it feels to me that when we think about, let's say if we put, a, um, uh, like, uh, it wouldn't seem to me totally arbitrary because there's a telos, right? The very concept of uh, moksha marg or the very concept of restraining karma, the very sense of the possibility of the siddha, right? Pure perception without obstruction. This doesn't seem arbitrary. It seems like that is the value claim that gets integrated in the system, right? Is, uh, when you say arbitrary, you mean arbitrary kind of system, all life, all societies wide? Or in the Jain tradition seems like it's trying to not be arbitrary at all, but to say, this is the value that we're imperfectly kind of folding into every activity. 
Well, historically, it is not so clear. Uh, that is the one point. Mm -hmm. And why not, uh, uh, what did uh, Shuba, uh, Ashuba, you know, uh, Shoda Shuba, you know, why not privileging this? Um, and uh, there is an internal pressure generated by the system itself once established. Uh, it creates its own problems, which then produce, uh, you know, fitting solutions. And then this creates this kind of differentiation, this dynamic of differentiation, which always can go in different directions at any juncture. And people can just drop it. You know, yeah. these are just distinctions. Start something new. <laughs> well, thank you very much.